The regular meeting of the Desert Community College District Board of Trustees is now called to order at 9.01 and a.m. You may join today's meeting in person at a limited capacity via Zoom webinar or watch the live stream from the College of the Desert YouTube channel. These links are accessible by visiting the College of the Desert homepage. A roll call. Dr. Garcia, please proceed with roll call. Good morning, Trustee Odin. Trust, Trustee Kinneman. Here. Trustee Perez. Trustee Gonzalez. Good morning, present. Trustee Stefan. Present. And if I could have our new student trustee, Isaac Zarko, who we will get to meet in a few moments, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd be thrilled. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much. And student trustee, this is the swearing in part and Isaac Sarko at this time, I'd like to welcome Isaac Sarko and ask you to please stand and raise your right hand and repeat after me. And I don't seem to have a copy of the oath, I'm sorry. Unless it's the first, you know. Oh, it's yeah. here, okay, okay. Let me do it this way. I've never had it done that way before. That's okay. Oops, so new. Okay. So here we go. At this time, I'd like to welcome Isaac Sarko, and uh, you're already standing and raise your right hand, and Trustee Gonzalez is going to take pictures. <laughs> so if you would, I, and then state your name, do solemnly swear I, I that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, or faithfully, <laughs> discharge the duties which upon which I am about to enter. And congratulations, and may I welcome you, and I know that all of the trustees here welcome you, and we're going to look eagerly to getting to know you, and we hope you'll participate very actively. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay. And that brings us down to 2.01, the board meeting agenda. Pursuant to the government code section 54954.2B2, the board may take action on items of business not appearing on the posted agenda upon a determination by a two thirds vote of the board. Or if less than two thirds of the members are present, a unanimous vote of those present that there is a need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of the local agency subsequent to the agenda being posted as specified. And it sounds like we went underwater there. Did we go under? <laughs> okay. Um, confirmation of the agenda. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the agenda for June 15th, 2023? Dear Stephan. I would like to make a motion that we amend the action item and post up action items 16.01, 02, and 03 until the interim president has been hired. 
O2 and O3. 1601, O2 and O3. 1601, 1602. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded to amend action items 16.01, 16.02, .01, 16 and 16.03 which um, hey would you like to it's been moved and seconded so would you like to speak to your motion please uh yes we've got a lot of contracts on here uh personal personnel contract renewals and i believe it would be appropriate for the new incoming interim president to be involved in bringing these forward Okay, um, the is there anyone that would like to speak against these motions at this time? If I may, Madam Chair. Yes. I actually would be opposed and reason being is that uh, from looking at some of the names here, I think it would be beneficial to have the input of the current president if there were any questions regarding any of the contracts. Okay. I'm sorry. I, there was a part I missed there. You said of the current what? That uh, there may be questions that we may have um, as trustees, and who better to answer our questions than the acting president before her departure? So that is my concern that if we hold these, then there may be questions that may not be able to be answered because there will be an interim that is not familiar with with uh, you know some of these folks here. And I, I do recognize we will have the uh, current president with us for until the end of the month. So I, I'm sure there could be some collaboration that could take place um, between okay. the incoming president. I don't agree, but I think we can do both. Okay, would anybody else like to give input on this important decision? on whether to amend um, by postponing these two until the incoming president um, has, um, or the incoming interim president has had a chance to be here and also give her input. Seeing no further discussion, um, we need to take a vote. Um, I'm looking up because we have, unfortunately, our, pre our um, president, uh, the board, um, the superintendent president, uh, Dr. Garcia is on Zoom. So um, if we could take a vote now, please. Student trustee Sarko. Yes. Trustee Odin. Yes. Trustee Kinneman. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. No. Trustee Stefan. I'm gonna vote yes. I think it would be prudent to wait. Motion. We can ask for Motion additional carries. comments later. Okay, so with that, those items will be um, withheld until um, the incoming interim president is able to be here. Madam Chair, just for clarity, can you yes. uh, can you state the items, please? The items uh, were 16.01, 16.02, and 16.03. Okay, um, are there any other additions, corrections, deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda stands approved as presented, or excuse me, as amended. Um, public comments, uh, 3.01, request for address to address the Board of Trustees regarding regular agenda items. Remote public participation is allowed and will be accepted in person by email to OP. OTP at collegeofthedesert.edu during the meeting and submitted for the record or by using the raise your hand function by joining the Zoom link pursuant to district administrative procedure 2345. Each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes per topic. 15 minutes shall be the maximum time allotment for public speakers on any one subject, regardless of the number of speakers at any one board meeting. At the discretion of a majority of the board, these limits may be extended. All comments must be submitted or brought forward prior to the end of the public comment section. 
As an additional note, this item is intended for members of the public who wish to speak regarding regular agenda items. An opportunity to address the board on matters not related to the agenda will be available during item 23.01 of today's agenda. Is there anyone that has requested the opportunity to speak? Yes, Chair Stefan, we have one individual uh, who would like to speak in person today on agenda item 12.11, and that is Mary Lou Marujo. During the discussion, of the approval of the amendment to the WRNS studio agreement for the Palm Springs development project, B. Gonzalez stated, I have been feeling that this project is going, I have a feeling that this project is going to be way, way over budget. This was shortly before she voted against approving the amendment. But less than 30 minutes later, B said, for the right, for me, the right decision will always depend on data, but because it doesn't lie. So which is it, B? Do you make decisions based on your feelings or do you make decisions based on data? Apparently it's whichever suits your impetuous behavior at the time. At the last meeting, Ruben asked, why does this project keep getting more expensive? One very big factor as to why the construction cost of the Palm Springs project continues to grow is because of the delays that have occurred since B, Ruben, Aurora hired Martha. Let's review the data. According to the enrollment by zip code presentation at the last meeting, in Desert Hot Springs and Cathedral City combined, there are 3,549 students. In Coachella, there are 2,025 students. Coachella students have a 60 minute bus drive from Coachella to our Indio campus with service every 20 minutes. Desert Hot Springs students have a minimum of 44 minutes each way to our Palm Desert campus. Their bus service is only once an hour. So who exactly lacks access to a COD campus? The data clearly shows that our West Valley students are in number, great number and deserve closer access to a permanent cam campus. Approve the work by design consulting services so that we can move forward with the Palm Springs campus, which will provide students more equal access to our permanent facilities. Ruben and B, stop playing games with your delay tactics, which amounts to the mishandling of public funds. And regarding this other item that was just uh, continued, thank you for uh, uh, continuing that uh, before, as the last shot before Martha and uh, uh, was leaving, she and Delindo are pulling shenanigans on all of the other contracts for the directors. Um, significant changes. However, it's funny, they didn't make any of those changes to Director Galindo's contract. So you should review that carefully before you move forward. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Yes, we have one individual on Zoom, uh, and that is Ernie Rios. And Ernie, you should be able to unmute yourself. Great. Uh, thank you. And uh, good morning, uh, trustees. Uh, my name is Ernie Rios uh, with the Thermal Oasis Community Council. Uh, and I hope your morning is going great. Um, I call today because I wanted to uh, provide again a friendly reminder around the importance of equitable access to a post-secondary education for our Valley youth. I'm uh, really excited that uh, the schematic design for uh, the Palm Springs campus uh, has been shared publicly. Um, as I've stated previously, we're in dire need of making access to a post-secondary education uh, equitable for our students across the Coachella Valley for reasons that you even heard this uh, earlier this morning. Um, our students are struggling um, to get to and from um, the College of the Desert campus and the more opportunities we have provide them, the better. And this is critical in the wake of the pandemic when we've seen enrollment declines, not only in the region, but nationally. And for this reason, you know, I ask again uh, to the board, uh, to please um, stay the course with uh, making these opportunities available to our students. We applaud you as a community uh, for making uh, the Palm Desert, uh, the Palm Springs campus uh, a reality for students as well as the Cathedral City campus and expansion in Indio. Um, but on that same note, um, we also ask that you stay the course with the commitments made 
uh, to the East Valley, uh, especially uh, at the Thermal Campus. Over the years, there were numerous commitments made publicly uh, to our students and so and community and families. Uh, just this week alone, I had an opportunity to participate in graduation events and scholarship ceremonies for the students. And it was a great uh, reminder uh, about the challenges that we still face in, in getting our students into and through post-secondary. And so I ask you uh, on behalf of our communities, not just the East Valley, but the entire region for those of us working with our students and understanding the, the need that we have across the region um, to stay the course and, and support that equitable access for our students. Thank you for allowing me this time and I wish you a great rest of the week and weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? That was the final individual wishing to speak on the site. Okay. Um, moving on, um, 4.01, approval of the May 19th, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the regular meeting minutes of May 19th, 2023? Yes. I will be abstaining from a one, two, and three. This is the minutes for the last meeting, the May meeting. Which one? The May meeting, the minutes? Yes. Um, you abstained from those votes? Is that? Yes. Oh, you were just coming in. So you, okay. Okay, so do, is that, do you understood that, right, Armando? Okay. So Madam Chair, that. for clarity, that won't be uh, put into the record until the time of action. So if you choose to recognize abstentions, that would be the time that that would occur. Oh, you're talking about today. No, you're, wait a minute. He's talking about. Oh, 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 okay, okay. So, okay, I understand, but but basically it is not a, it's, um, he's just abstaining from the vote part. Okay, I got it. Okay, if there's no corrections to the minutes, they stand approved as um, presented and it will be a um, one abstention vote. Okay, on that. And 4.02, approval of May 19th, 2023 special meeting minutes. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the regular meeting minutes of May 19th, 2023? And if there are no corrections to the minutes, they stand approved as a 4-1 vote, one person abstaining. And then approval of the June 1st, 2023 special meeting minutes. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the special meeting minutes of June 1, 2023? And I have a question on this. You were at that meeting and you're already a trustee. So um, you're not abstaining from this one. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. So if there are no corrections to the minutes, they will stand approved as presented, and that'll be a 5 0 vote. <clears throat> Reports Associated Students of College of the Desert, ASCOT. We have, we don't have anyone to give a report. Okay, College of the Desert Foundation. There is a written report was submitted and included for the record from Katherine Abbott, the executive director of the COD Foundation. So um, that is there. College of the Desert Alumni Association. There is no report. Uh, California School Employees Association, CSEA. There is no report. College of the Desert Adjunct Association, CODAA. Um, I believe Catherine Levitt, C CODA president, is here. Yeah. Welcome back, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. 
Trustees, Madam Chair, uh, CODA and the adjunct community we represent are pleased to welcome Ron Odom to the Board of Trustees, knowing he has knowledge and appreciation for the history and politics of both this area and this institution that would not be possible without his years as an adjunct faculty in the social science at COD. We are hopeful that his leadership skills will mend some of the schisms that have wracked this college and burdened the community over the past year, allowing the Board of Trustees to return to its mission of service to students through good governance. ACOTA thanks Vice President uh, Martinez Garcia for the opportunity to meet with the deans, both instructional and non-instructional, to discuss CODA's collective bargaining agreement towards the development of common procedures and common practice that are consistent across the schools. This doesn't happen right now, so this is a big step forward. We are confident through this, through communication, we can clear up the differences in expectations engendered by the ambiguity of contract language. To this end, we are hoping to sunshine our non-compensation reopener as Article 14 reemployment process to clarify areas in language that have been the subject of a lot of confusion. As this is a step towards parity, this is a step towards equity. Uh, CODA would also like to thank Vi Vice President Galindo and Vice President um, Ron, Rod Garcia, um, Interim Vice Presidents Vigo and Dunn, as well as Diana Gojero and our payroll team under Val Martinez for very expeditious payment of a retroactive COLA and updated pay schedule that includes the ongoing COLA. No, no errors or omissions were hap happened in, during this updated pay, and that's a true feat at the school. And so I thank you very much and have a very nice June. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, College of the Desert Faculty Association, um, a written report was submitted and included in the record from Oceana Collins, the code for president. Academic Senate, <coughs> excuse me, has no report. And governing board, student trustees, Zarco, welcome. Hello. All right, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. As you know, my name is Isaac Zarco. I was born and raised in the city of festivals, Indio. As summer started, I began my second year here at College of the Desert. So far, it's been a great experience and I'm only seeing it get greater. Passion is a very important thing for me. I'm passionate about education as it could bring many possibilities and opportunities as I know it did for me. Another one is music from instruments to using my vo voice. Speaking is a big one for me, as being able to communicate clearly and confidently can only lead to great things. Academically, I try to be the best student I could be. My first semester, I got on the Dean's List and looking forward, I believe I'll get on it again and again. As time goes on, I will understand and embrace what it means to be a student trustee. One of my beliefs is that students come first and how this college can give them opportunities and send them off to great things. The importance as a student is not just from the student trustee or from the student government, but from every single student that comes to this college. I look forward to gaining experience and friends from this role. I want to show appreciation to this previous student trustee, Alan Paul, as he was not just a mentor to me, but also a great friend. Thank you for welcoming me and to a great academic year. Thank you. And we really do want to welcome you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask one of the trustees. We'll help you in any way we can. Okay, and we'll probably encourage you to attend many, many conferences okay. so that you can learn as much as possible. And Trustee Odin, it's time for your report. Oh, well, your button. Light. Yes, thank yes. you. I am still on the learning curve, obviously, even with the technology. <laughs> with the technology, but um, I've, this has kind of been a, a whirlwind for me. I've met with so many different people and so many different ideas and concepts, and I'm really looking forward to getting more involved and communicating with the broad-based community, not only within my district, but throughout the Coachella Valley. Well, again, we welcome you aboard, and we realize this is only your really your first full meeting. 
Yes. So this will be exciting. And believe me, I am beaming with ideas. So you'll be hearing from me very soon. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Okay. And Trustee Kinneman, your report, please. Uh, just briefly, uh, the COD commencement was a very moving experience. And I want to thank everybody that participated in putting that together. Uh, and it was an, in a nice, cool location, which was also greatly appreciated. But it was uh, very joyful to see so many smiling faces go across that stage. In addition, I want to acknowledge the Palm Springs Planning and Development Committee. They finalized their work yesterday, as we heard earlier, and we are at 100% schematic design, so they're going to be able to move forward uh, with that design as well. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. And Trustee Perez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to thank um, all the was involved with um, the commencement. It was a great experience. Um, and as Trustee Kinnaman mentioned, it wasn't a cool place. Actually, I heard people complaining that it was a little too cold. And I don't think I want to hear that ever again, because as we know, uh, we've been dealing with some hot graduations and some very, pretty windy graduations, commencements the last few years. So it was nice to have something indoors. Um, thank you to the committee and to all of our students who participated. Um, and uh, last but not least, I want to give one final farewell uh, to um, Dr. Garcia. Uh, Dr. Garcia, thank you for everything that you did for College of the Desert while you were here, um, considering the, the circumstances that you came into. Um, I'm really excited to see what it is that you do at Mount Sac Community College because um, with the buy-in of the community and um, I know that, and the support of the trustees, I know that you're going to be able to accomplish some great things. So um, I'm excited to see you in different conferences throughout the year so I can hear about the amazing things that, that you're doing. And hopefully we're able to implement some of those things here at the College of the Desert. Okay, thank you. And Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning again. Um, I will echo the sentiments of our, my fellow trustees. Commencement was amazing as always. Um, it's always, for me, a uh, little added um, point that I oftentimes know so many of the uh, students that are, are going through commencement. And it's just really amazing uh, to see that, you know, there's these opportunities uh, for them. And I'm hoping moving forward that, you know, as a, as a body here, as a board, that we ensure that equitable access. And, you know, I hope we get to the point where we need the entire arena because there's so many students. And of course, that's only going to happen if, you know, students are able to access education. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend the pinning ceremony for the nursing program. And I'm not sure if anyone recorded uh, the speaker, the student speaker, but it was beyond touching and moving. I mean, it, wow. If anyone has it, please let us know because I would love for the, the other trustees to listen to that message. That young man was just phenomenal. I mean, it was, you know, I, I'm not one that gets emotional too easily, but I'll tell you, I got pretty close. I mean, it was great. The ceremony was beautiful. Everything was perfectly set up. Um, I just want to say thank you to staff for putting together such an amazing event very well attended. I don't think there was uh, very many empty seats, maybe one or two. Uh, and with that, I also wanna echo uh, Trustee Perez's uh, comments. Dr. Garcia, thank you so much. Uh, they're very fortunate to have you. And I agree, um, you know, you, there you are being welcomed as you should have been. Um, and the trustees are very excited uh, to have you on board. And I wish you the absolute best and it was unfortunate that uh, we weren't able to provide you the space that you needed to implement all of those amazing ideas that you had that I know would have uh, been very well received here. But nonetheless, we move forward and I wish you the absolute best, Dr. Garcia, and I do thank you uh, for your time. You could have easily just said, I'm out, but here you are still with us virtually today. So I just wanna appreciate a person of your level of uh, caliber character um, that I think is very refreshing in the times that we're in right now. So with that, just thank you to everyone who was part of uh, organizing commencement and pending ceremony. 
And I'm, you know, hoping, unfortunately, sometimes due to my work schedule, I really can't attend a lot of events. But when I do, it's just really awesome. Um, I really loved the event after commencement where staff was able to relax and interact. And that's the best form that I like to see people in is a raw form, right? Your true selves, um, altruistic. It's a great experience. And I just want to say that, you know, I've been able to uh, touch base with some of you and, you know, have more conversations. And I'm just looking forward to, to more of that. And just know that I'm always available if, if you need uh, to speak with me. So with that, I think that's about all for me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as for my report, I want to thank everyone at the college that made graduation a possibility for so many in our valley. And, um, you know, I don't think we realize sometimes we don't just have the graduates there. We have their whole families. We have all their friends. We have all their former teachers. We have anybody that ever knew some of those students and hoped that that student would have an opportunity to become everything that they could be. And I'll tell you that venue, when I stood on that stage and I looked out at that venue, um, that we had there, the people in the stands, the fact that it wasn't 100 degrees out, we weren't all melting in our caps and gowns. And those students, their faces, and looking up into the stands and seeing that packed house and all of those faces smiling down, there's nothing greater no greater reward that I don't think anybody could ever give me than having that opportunity. I mean, that is just so meaningful. So anybody that did anything, even made a kind comment to a student or just said hi to a student so that they came back the next day, I wanna thank you from the very, very bottom of my heart for making that night a possibility for each of those students. Um, I asked my um, fellow trustees to stand up there with me so that they were congratulated, not just by one trustee, but that they had an opportunity to see how proud each and every one of us were. And I'll tell you, sitting on that stage, knowing that the faculty and the leadership of this campus are all up there behind us or else they're in the the that area in front where the students are, helping those students, cheering them on. That, that's an unbelievable feeling. It just really is to know that there's all those people behind each and every one of those students. And you can just feel the warmth on the stage. And I'll tell you, I was afraid that ice was going to melt. Because even though some of those students, and I know my fellow trustees felt some of them, especially at the end, they were icy cold when they came up there, you know, and I put my arm around them and, um, you know, for the picture that, you know, they were really, really cold. And, um, and I wasn't complaining because, you know, I mean, I was glad we weren't hot, but um, I know that some of them were shivering and, and some of them were scared. But what they accomplished and what they were able to do because of each individual in our community that touched base with them and encouraged them on is just incredible. So thank you to everyone at the college. Thank you to everyone in the community. Thank you to all the families and the friends. And thank you so much to every one of those students because there's no greater gift than anybody could ever give me than to see those students graduate. So I just wanted to say that. And I also want to say um, the best, I wish the very, very best for our superintendent president, um, um, Garcia, as she embarks on um, furthering her journey and her career. And I know that um, things have been rough here. Um, I always tell people when I'm going through a rough patch, you know, this is going to get me ready for the next thing. I don't know what and I don't know when, um, but um, whatever you learned here, I hope that it will serve you well in whatever challenge 
you encounter in the future. And I know that there's nothing that you can't accomplish because of the way that you were able to handle yourself here and move on and move forward. So um, I uh, applaud you, I thank you, and I wish you the very, very best. And thank you so much for um, the two graduations that you were here for, because like I said, there is no greater gift that anybody could give me than to see those students graduate, or children of the Valley graduating uh, from a community college. So thank you all so much again. And with that, I'll move on. Uh, Superintendent President Garcia, it's your opportunity to speak. First of all, thank you, um, Trustee Stefan, uh, Trustee Perez, and Trustee Gonzalez for those beautiful words. I want to start by sharing uh, some highlights regarding commencement. Uh, all of you have indicated how amazing it was, and it really was. It was impressive. Uh, I want to ensure that I once again congratulate our graduating class of 2023. Next slide, please. We had 796 particip uh, students participate and about 5,000 attendees. I want to express tremendous gratitude as has been expressed to everyone involved, especially to Andre Pacheco who led uh, commencement for us since we had a need for someone to fill that role. But there were so many volunteers um, that made this day so special. So I wanna thank the students, their families, their loved ones, the faculty, staff, the administrators, volunteers, and the board of trustees. Next slide. This is a slide with a few additional pictures of that amazing day. And next slide, please. Summer term, I, it has started and we have six week classes that end on July 20th and eight week classes that end on August 3rd. Summer enrollment is looking great. So we are excited about that. And fall classes will start on Friday, August 25th. And the final slide, please. I want to end by thanking everyone, thanking the amazing employees of College of the Desert for their dedication to our students, to the work that they do with pride. I'm grateful for the opportunity, grateful for being able to serve our amazing students with all of you. And I want to thank the Board of Trustees for the opportunity and wish you all the best. This is a new start for everyone. And I know that you all will continue doing what you do best, which is serve, teach, guide our students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent President Garcia. Um, at this time, public updates. We have uh, 6.01, Proclamation for Pride Month 2023. At this time, I'd like to invite Dean Steckman, Lead Counselor for the Gender and Sexual Diversity Pride Center to introduce our student reader. They have also prepared a presentation for us on gender neutral and inclusive restaurants. Hello, is this on? Uh, yes. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Chair Stefan, Board of Trustees, Superintendent, President, Dr. Garcia, President's Cabinet, and College of the Desert community. I am Dean Steckman, the CalWORKs Counselor Coordinator here at College of the Desert, um, and also the uh, Faculty Advisor for Sexuality and Gender Alliance, also known as the Saga Club here at COD. It is an honor for me to introduce to you today, Will Frank, a member of College of the Desert's Pride Student Leadership Team, Saga Club's incoming president, and Social Justice Club's incoming pre uh, vice president. Will is a social uh, sociology major, sorry, 
His goal after completing his associate's degree from COD is to transfer and double major in sociology and urban planning at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. In addition to his role in planning and participating in Pride Center events, you may have seen Will in some of COD's theater productions. My personal favorite was his role as Tin Man in the, Fry, uh, in the Friends of Dorothy Pride um, Award and Talent Showcase that we had this past spring in May. Will, the other Pride student leaders, and Saga members had an amazing spring semester and overall an amazing academic year. They represented COD at events like the Rainbow Youth Summit, the Desert Age Walk, the um, East, Co East Coachella Valley Pride, Palm Springs Trans Pride Fair, Palm Springs Red Dress uh, Party, the Cathedral City LGBT Days, and Harvey Milk Diversity Breakfast. The Pride student leaders also hosted a very well attended and epic Friends of Dorothy Pride Awards and Talent Showcase in May. In addition, our Pride student leaders and Saga members participated in our spring safe zone training where they were able to bring light to the issues students from the LGBTQIA community face in the classroom and on campus and left an impact on our faculty, staff, and administrators that were in attendance. Their efforts directly served the mission of the Gender and sexual, sexual Diversity Pride Center and the district. And we are excited to support their future efforts to celebrate COD's LGBTQIA community. And with that, I would like to ask Will to read the June Pride uh, Month proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, Dean, for that introduction, and thank you to the Board of Trustees for recognizing us and granting us this time to speak. Whereas the Desert Community College District recognizes our community's diversity as one of our greatest strengths, and promotes inclusion as a key priority by celebrating diversity in people, philosophies, cultures, beliefs, and backgrounds. And whereas the Desert Community College District recognizes that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer plus or LGBTQ plus people come from all walks of life, including race, ethnicity, religion, ancestry, national origin, economic status, physical or mental ability, medical condition, sex or gender identity or expression. And whereas a growing body of research indicates that LGBTQ plus people of color are adversely affected by cumulative discrimination and social exclusion, including racism from the LGBTQ plus community and homophobia and heterosexism within their racial slash ethnic community. And whereas in 2016, the American College Health Association found that out of a sample of more than 33,000 undergraduate students, 10% identified as gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, or questioning. And whereas recent research of college undergraduate students illustrated that 65.1% experienced harassing behavior since enrolling in school, 21.5% reported intimate partner violence, and 15.2% reported having been stalked. And whereas the struggle for dignity and equality for LGBTQ plus people is mirrored in the determined dedication of advocates and allies who strive to create a more inclusive society and kinder community. And whereas LGBTQ plus Americans, including those who live in our local communities, continue to face marginalization, discrimination, and hatred simply for being who they are and for whom they love. And whereas the landmark Supreme Court decision of 2015 guaranteeing marriage equality in all 50 states was a historic victory for LGBTQ plus Americans and continues to affirm the belief that we are all freer when we are treated as equals. And whereas the rainbow flag, also known as the LGBTQ plus pride flag, serves as a symbol of hope and inclusion to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the LGBTQ plus movement, and whereas flying the rainbow flag throughout the month of June further symbolizes the celebration, support, and affirmation of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And whereas June is a time to celebrate and affirm our LGBTQ plus community, raise awareness of quality services, and foster dialogue to promote healthy, safe, and prosperous college communities for all. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees the Desert Community College District declare that June 2023 as Pride Month and encourage students, faculty, and staff to eliminate prejudice wherever it exists and celebrate LGBTQ members of our community. 
Thank you. And now I yield my time back to Dean. All right, so before we get into our presentation today, I just wanted to make a few um, comments. So we are all excited for the opportunity to present on the importance of gender inclusive restrooms before you today. Um, an important note is that this, pre this presentation was not requested by any board member, but rather our students behind me and that will join me in a second, felt it very important to present on the matter. Um, and it is only fitting that we were able to do so during the Pride Month alongside the reading of the Pride Proclamation. Another note, um, the gender inclusive restroom resolution was brought forward to the academic senate early in spring and it passed in unanimously so it is ready to move forward, I believe to CPC. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, have our pride student leaders and saga members join me so that we can go ahead and get into this presentation. And then, okay, cool. All right, sounds good. Uh, can we make it main, like big screen if possible? If not, can you all see that? Screen. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, so I'm, we're gonna go ahead and start with introductions. Again, my name is Dean Steckman. My pronouns are he, him, his. And then I'll go ahead and pass it to our students. My name is Isabella. My pronouns are she, they. My name is CJ Madison, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm Eduardo Alvarez, and I go from he, him. Hello, my name is Emily Lopez, and I'm, I go by she, her. Hello, my name, is, my name is Sunny Ramirez, and I go by she, her. Hello, my name is Ruby Dewar, and I go by she, her. Hi, my name is Will Frank. My pronouns are he, they, and she. Hello, my name is Abdiel Morales, and my pronouns are he, him, his, and El. Sorry, it's live. Okay, um, all right, so we'll go ahead and get started with, um, well, let me make mention real quick. Um, Alexi was not able to join us today, but they were integral in um, putting together the presentation that you see before you. Um, so I just wanted to make mention of that. And then with that, we'll go ahead and start off with Bella. We stand here today as a community with utmost pride in sharing our resolution. Um, in our efforts in advocating for gender inclusive restrooms to be installed on the College of the Desert, Palm Desert campus and beyond. So it is imperative that all College of the Desert constituents such as faculty and students know that there are gender inclusive restrooms on campus um, beyond the only three single user restrooms that we have in accordance with the Act 1732. Um, and feel that they are safe emotionally and physically for their well-being. So we're here to reinforce this diverse and welcoming environment on campus and stress the accessibility part of College of the Desert's um, one of core mission values um, that they feel they have access to this more than just three of these restaurants on campus. And Another point we'd like to address is that these restrooms also help ease gender dysphoria and transgender and gender nonconforming individuals and foster this safe space where these gender nonconforming individuals uh, feel comfortable enough and supported as well as safe on campus without any harassment or discrimination. And we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is my, oh, well, is this the mic still on? All right, this is my slide. So uh, what is gender dysphoria? Gender dysphoria is described as distress as a result of one's gender not um, being affirmed. And I'm not gonna read the rest, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk about my personal and lived experience with this. 
Um, I identify, I'm a transgender man and I didn't transition until later in life. I transitioned when I was 30 years old and I had the support um, at UCLA to do so because they have a robust um, and supportive environment for the LGBTQ plus community. Before I transitioned, I lived um, you know, in the closet. Um, I have a single parent of two and I kind of just conformed to what society, society wanted me to be. Uh, so I wasn't able to live my true self. But when I started going to higher education at Moreno Valley College, before I even transferred to UCLA, I um, started to, I guess, figure myself out a lot more, feel more confident and more comfortable in my own skin. Um, at that time, I identified as a lesbian woman, but I was masculine presenting. And my experience then using the restrooms um, because at the time there were less gender inclusive restrooms or single stall restrooms to use. Um, although I did not get like confronted like many transgender and gender non-conforming folks do, I did get a lot of stares and I, may, I was made to feel uncomfortable every single time I used the restroom. Um, I could talk about an, a, like an experience of that and just this is just one of many. Um, using the restroom after, after using the restroom, washing my hands, I would all often see, you know, people coming into the restroom after me, and then they would stop immediately, do a double take, walk back out, look at the signage, make sure that they were entering into the right restroom, and then look at me as though I did not belong in there, and that I was a threat to them, that I was going to hurt them in some way by me just using the restroom. Um, so then they would just go ahead and proceed with caution to use the restroom. So that was usually, that was my typical experience with using the restroom as a masculine presenting woman before I transitioned. So I always was uncomfortable using the restroom and that's just a basic human right to be able to use the restroom, right? So fast forward to when I did transition and early in my transition, that was even harder because at that time I was, you know, transitioning. So I started to present more masculine. Um, and it would it became more uncomfortable going into the women's restroom. So either I had to not drink, not do certain things. I had to be very mindful of the space that I was in because of like fear of, you know, somebody confronting me in the restroom. You never know, especially with the climate that existed during the time that I transitioned. I transitioned in 2016. And so um I mean, I could go on and on and on, but that, that's kind of just the experience, you know? So I would either just avoid using the restroom altogether, which is not healthy at all, um, or I would just have to always be mindful of the environment I'm in, the people I'm surrounded by. Um, luckily for me, when I transitioned at UCLA, there was so much gender neutral restrooms there, so I didn't really have to worry so much, but I did have to go find those places. When I started to um, pass as male, it was easier because then I was able to use the male identified restrooms. But even to this day, no one thinks that I'm trans unless I disclose that I'm trans. I still feel dysphoria. I still feel anxious going into the restroom. And the reason for that, I know it's in my head, but I have to go use the stall. So when I use the stall, um, I, for some reason, I think that if there's any other person in the restroom, they're gonna know I'm trans by the stream the sound of the stream, or because I went to the stall in the first place. Like, why aren't you using the urinal? Um, so these are things that I think about often. So I'll stay in the restroom longer than I need to, just to make it seem like I'm actually using the stall for what cis men would use the stall for, right? Or usually, I know there's probably some that use the restroom sitting down, but um, I still feel this to this day, even here on campus when I use the restroom. There, um, I know that we have more gender inclusive or single stall or family designated restrooms, but most of them are only accessible to staff and faculty, not to our students. And um, I'm only sharing my experience because we did not have a student to share a personal experience, but we do have some students that actually have this experience and that come to us and share this with us. And so we thought it would be impactful for you to hear a little bit about that, but we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. If we could pull it up. Thank you for listening. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to CJ to uh, present on stats. Good morning, trustees. Uh, I want to bring your attention to an experience that occurs to over half of transgender people in this country. According to the 2015 US Transgender Survey, 
60% of transgender individuals say that they have avoided restrooms to prevent confrontations. These confrontations include sexual, physical, or verbal assault and harassment. These confrontations are not uncommon in higher education. 22% of college and vocational students who were out or perceived as transgender described experiencing confrontation at school. 12% of respondents were verbally harassed in a restroom, 1% were physically attacked, and another 1% were sexually assaulted in a bathroom. The frequent experience of discrimination, harassment, and marginalization of transgender and gender nonconforming people across college campuses have had dire consequences. 31% of those who took the survey reported drinking or eating less throughout the day to avoid using the restroom. 6% even reported developing kidney disease due to not using the restroom. But I wanna make a broader point here. At a time when trans and non-gender conforming people's existence has become politicized, colleges must take steps to support trans and non-binary non students better. Somewhere I read that the College of the Desert out to be a culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. When 82% of transgender individuals report self-harming or mutilating, or excuse me, when 82% of transgender individuals report having suicidal ideations, 40% making an attempt to commit suicide, and 66% having reported self-harming or mutilating at some point, inclusion matters. These are the consequences when intolerance and discrimination are rampant. And I want the College of the Desert to be a place, no matter where you come from or your family background, you can come here and feel safe. Inclusion is the first characteristic highlighted in our mission statement. And there is no better way to abide by that principle than to help trans people feel where they have so often not been safe. And that is why gender inclusion restrooms are so important. And we must look at possible solutions. And I'm gonna pass it over here to my friend, Ruby. Hello, everyone. So this is the outside or the pictures where the uh, gender and Sexual Diversity Pride Center. They are the bathrooms right outside. And as you can see, they are gendered bathrooms, which kind of goes against our values at the Pride Center to be a safe, supportive, and inclusive environment for all of our LGBTQIA plus students. We wanna make sure that every student, especially the ones that come here, uh, feel safe and comfortable to go to the bathroom. I had an experience at Club Rush. A student came up to me and shared his experience of being attacked in one of the bathrooms here. He was dressed feminine presenting and just wanted to feel good about himself and went into the bathroom and another student in there did not feel comfortable, attacked him verbally and physically. And there was really nothing that could be done about that in that time. Uh, I know he went to the school for support and there wasn't much there. That's why he talked to me at Club Rush to see what else could be done. And just kind of goes to show that events like that are happening on this campus and there is a very big need for these types of bathrooms. And yeah, it would be very helpful to have them. Abdul. Hello. Um, so I would like to point out that regardless who you identify, gay, trans, straight, we can all agree that it's more important to focus on your hygiene and your health. People shouldn't care if you identify who you identify and you belong to this bathroom or this bathroom. I'd say it's more important that everybody should focus on washing their hands, staying clean, being clean as an individual for their uh, families, friends, and people who come to the restroom. You know, it's more important to stay hygiened, cleaned, and well presenting and not worry about who's next to you or what, what are they going to do to you. Everyone's there to do their business and just go on to the, do the next thing to do. You know, it's your health, your hygiene. That's what, that's what we should focus on mostly and not just, oh, who's, who's here with me thing, and that sort of thing. Thank you. So that is the end of our presentation. Thank you all for listening. Um, I want to thank Will and Dean for um, the proclamation, and I want to thank the entire group for coming forward and giving us that um, presentation on gender and sexual diversity um, for the um, 
gender neutral and inclusive restrooms. I think that um, that is extremely important. We want our students to be safe. We want them to feel that they are part of a college. And um, I know that we will take this matter very, very serious. Um, we appreciate the time and effort you have invested in preparing the presentation and for raising our awareness about the significance in creating the inclusive spaces for all individuals. Your voices do matter in our ongoing journey towards greater diversity and inclusivity. So thank you again for your presentation, each and every one of you, and for your courage and your bravery in coming forward and presenting for us today. Really appreciate that. Um, at this time, we'll move on to 6.02, the National Cyber League NCL recognition. At this time, I'd like to invite Professor Felix um, Morning. Maruen. Oh. I'm never going to say that yes. right, am I? I'll let you say it for <laughs> I never get it right. Um, if you could, please, the Professor of Computer Information System. You're going to be presenting this item, if you will please proceed. Good morning. Trustees, good morning. Uh, Felix Maruendo Donate, I'm professor of computer information systems here at the College of the Desert. Uh, I've been here since 2006, where I started in math back then in 2010 and created the EDGE program for you guys. Um, in 2016 is when uh, went over to computer information systems and created the cybersecurity program. So I've been there since then, and uh, I'm not alone here. I got five people, so myself included. Martino is uh, one of my students, and online, are they in there? I got Wes, Mason, uh, and Flores. Can you let them in? So anyways, um, we have uh, the cybersecurity program over in uh, the business building. Uh, we, on Fridays, we have a club called CODIS where we meet uh, regularly on Fridays from 10 till two. Yep. And we do all kinds of different activities regarding uh, system builds, uh, all kinds of random stuff, mm -hmm. including cybersecurity competitions. And I've come by and talked to you guys all about it. But this year, this last year was our best year. We, uh, we compete in National Cyber League. I'm gonna let Flores talk about that. So is he, is he live? Yeah, He's I'm here. In Atlanta. Uh, greetings okay. everyone, uh, Board of Trustees, uh, President Garcia. I'm in uh, Tyrone, Georgia. As you see my background, that's my dog, but uh, that's just a picture, that's my background. Anyways, um, yes, uh, we did an outstanding job, or actually our students did an outstanding job this year. Uh, Wesley Rosenrock uh, is, or was our president for the this last semester. He encouraged a lot of people to show up. We had about 45 to 50 uh, club members. So this is not an ordinary club. Uh, they put in a lot of time, four hours every Friday. So we're there. Thanks to my team, uh, Felix Marendo Donate, Mark Brenner from Indio High School, who uh, does our dual enrollment and our students from uh, Indio High School also participate. Uh, Professor Patrick, J Patrick Jacobs and uh, Mark Rizzo. I'd also like to thank uh, Dean Neil Lingle for our support and Nori Bambush, who's always been helpful to us. Um, these, uh, these club members have worked their butts off, <laughs> excuse the language, but they have worked hard this whole semester and the fruits of their labors have shown because we are nationally ranked number 62 in the nation. And I want to express my thanks to, to Wesley Mason, uh, Martino, Julian, a whole bunch of other students that I, I, just, I just can't name off because it's, the list is so long. But these four right here have been the heart of the club this semester. And I really appreciate all the work that we've done. So we had uh, uh, several different teams that came together for the competition. Uh, we passed the first round and then the second round, the four students that were here to recognize were the ones who were mentioned. So. Uh, you want to go ahead, Martino? Yeah, sure. Is this on? Okay, cool. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, I just like to thank everybody uh, for giving us the opportunity. I've learned more than I thought I could ever learn about any of this uh, 
any of this stuff, computers, cybersecurity, uh, just general uh, safety, basically online safety. Um, yeah, uh, this club is amazing. Um, we have amazing an amazing group, um, some great teams uh, uh, in the college. Um, and more importantly, I, I'm glad that everybody uh, uh, was who competed wanted to be there, you know. Um, if they didn't want to be there, then they could just leave. But um, but yeah, we we all uh, we all learned an amazing amount. I, I think I speak for Mason and uh, Wesley here. Um, we learned more than we could ever think possible, you know, with this cybersecurity. Um, yeah, this club is amazing, and I hope it keeps going and grows even further. One of the goals for the club was with the transition to everything being online, we sort of lost that connection mm -hmm. with our students mm -hmm. and between themselves, too. So it was a chance for us to bring them together over pizza and competitions yeah. and activities and all that fun stuff. And it worked out really well. Uh, most of our courses are offered online and there's there is a disconnect so by bringing them together we had 30 some students every friday which is actually kind of amazing when you see that there's no one walking around here mm -hmm. so uh that goal has been fulfilled uh martino is also part of the cis geeks yeah yes um so we have a group of uh it was four people this last semester um and basically people brought their computers, uh, laptops, tablets, phones into us and, uh, and we repaired them um, uh, to the best of our abilities. And we learned a whole bunch in that too. Uh, yeah, I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't know, uh, you know, really what happened inside uh, computers and laptops and, and especially like phones and tablets, you, you know, you don't really need to open that stuff for anything unless you know, you're trying to learn and uh, we got the opportunity to do that this semester. So I, I'm really, uh, I'm really happy I took part in that. Online, we also have uh, Wes, uh, Wesley Rosenrode. He's uh, the former president, no, the current president, former, current, right, Wes? Yes, current. I get, I get all this stuff. So go ahead, Wes. Yeah, um, uh, the gl a club is a great opportunity. Um, I joined because I heard there was pizza <laughs> and, uh, all this other stuff was going on um but uh yeah um what we learn in the classroom um is is enhanced at the club because we we implement it and it really sinks in and it becomes almost like reflex then instead of just like you know in the future dusting it off now it's it's ingrained all the stuff we learned in the club um and such as like network security um, you know, going on the other side, the, we call it red team, blue team. The red team is more of the penetration of networks and the blue team is more of a hardening the system. So um, learning the red team stuff through these um, competitions uh, makes you better at uh, network security. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great opportunity to these um, challenges. And um, being face to face with other club members like Mason, um, it it's competition. So we better ourselves. I want to be better because Mason was beating me at the tournament. So I had to beat him. <laughs> and now we're both going to San Bernardino. And I hope that kind of, you know, friendly, um, what do you call it? Like, not rivalry. Um, competitiveness. Competitiveness yeah. um, sticks. It just makes, I think, all of us better. And then when we come together as a team, um, I noticed that uh, we all clicked and we were doing things just naturally um, during the team competition. So yeah, it's, it's a, uh, the club is a great opportunity to further your education in, in the field of computer information. You wanna tell about transfer, Wes? Oh yeah, and um, I'm on the, I was, since I came back to COD, um, I took the um, cybersecurity program and uh, I'm proud of making the Dean's list every semester since I've been back. And now I am transferring to San Bernardino. Um, I'm taking some classes at um, the Palm Desert campus. And I'm also taking a class on the physical campus. And I hope to join the club there as well um, and look into it. And um, hopefully I can expand it. Um, all from what I learned at the club at, at COD, hopefully I can bring some of what I've learned there and leadership skills and apply it at San Bernardino.
Thanks, Wes. You want to go ahead, Mason? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Mason Vega. I'm the former club president until uh, Wesley beat me in the last election. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to um, reiterate what Wesley and Martino were saying, these competitions have really helped me with confidence. Um, what we have learned, we've gotten an opportunity to apply and like Wes was saying, become second nature to us, uh, take the theoretical into the um, practical. And because of the leadership of Professor uh, Flores and Professor Felix, uh, we've had the opportunity to do so in our club and not just these competitions, but they've provided us with other opportunities such as um, just, you know, their leadership, always having someone around to speak to. Um, two years ago, I decided to make a major career change and that's when I joined College of the Desert. And because of their guidance, um, I'm transferring to Cal State San Bernardino in the fall uh, into a good cybersecurity program. And I'm sure that's what I want to do. Um, I got I always was able to pick their brains about transfer, about what I wanted to do. And on top of all of this, um, their network has really been helpful to us. I know they brought in a representative of, from Eisenhower Health to speak recently. And because of talking to that representative that they brought in, um, I'm now starting a career at Eisenhower Health at the end of this month. So I'm immensely thankful to College of the Desert and to them for their guidance and the club who um, all the students we've been able to bounce everything back and forth off of. And I've just had a wonderful time here with all of them. So thank you. They're, they're together not because they're roommates, they're actually at the Palm Springs campus. Uh, we're having our Code on the Road program there this week. Uh, next week, we're taking a little break. Uh, Martino actually did it last summer with us. Yeah, yeah, I was there. When we started, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Martha Garcia, mm -hmm. Dr. Garcia, she's the one that got us started when she was first meeting. I was doing public comments because I needed help. I had this great idea and I needed someone to help me develop it. So she stepped in and thanks to her leadership, we made this happen. This is the second year, the second summer that we're offering in the road format. And we're starting in Palm Springs this week. We're hosting uh, cyber camps, which is cybersecurity competitions for uh, middle school, high school, and adults. So the ones that we're having in Palm Springs this week is uh, standard, which is more middle school uh, aged, which is really the right target to get kids interested in the industry. If we just sit back and wait until students get to us, it's a little too late. High school, they already made up their minds, and by the time they get to us, they're not thinking about CIS if they haven't seen it before. So their goal is to get out there early and start planting the seed of uh, not just not just cybersecurity and CIS, but a bi education. And we talk a lot about education, scholarships, opportunities, careers, and all that good stuff. So today I'm taking a break from it. They're there right now, uh, but tomorrow we have competitions. So uh, Fridays, we go Monday through Thursday, nine to one. We're doing trainings. And then on Fridays, we do competitions. And it's a simulated attack on a computer system and they need to harden the system, harden the network to prevent attacks. So they get scored on how many of the vulnerabilities they secure. And it's a nationwide competition, not just local. Uh, next week, we're off. The week after that, we're in Desert Hot Springs, uh, then uh, Toro Canyon Middle School in Coachella. Uh, same thing, the Desert Mirage right there. Uh, and then we come back here, Palm Desert and India for two more sessions. Uh, India and Palm Desert are full. Paul, uh, Coachella is halfway full. So we're getting there, all right? So it's uh, it's been fun, all right? And it's... Uh, it's a summer activity for us. And it's really uh, rewarding to work with kids and have them see, have them visualize themselves as uh, college students and then future hmm, in a career that involves technology. What else? Oh, so I wanna invite you all to come Fridays, all right? Just shoot me an email and I'll let you know the locations and times and all that stuff, but you know where it's at. So um, we're always, I'm inviting parents and they, I got certificates for them. They all show up. They're really proud to take pictures. They love it. We always ask for feedback. Their reviews are amazing. They just want us to keep continuing. So in an effort to pro promote the program, I've been on KSQ, uh, Eye in the Desert, Telemundo, doing all kinds of things to get the word out. 
So trying to get some positive press so that we can uh, really show our assets and what we really focus on in this college, which is our youth in the Valley. Um, so if I, if I may. Yeah, go I, would also, I would also uh, like to uh, congratulate the, the CODIS club for a second place uh, finish in the IE Mayor's Cup, Inland yes. Empire Mayor's Cyber Cup, and also for a fifth place in the SoCal Cyber Cup, which we competed against in Pearl Valley, San Diego County, Orange County, LA County, Riverside County, and San Bernardino County. We got a healthy competition with RCC. In Moreno Valley, we got a couple faculty over there that we know. Oh, RCC is ranked number 92 <laughs> in the nation. We're 60. <laughs> we beat them. So that's good. That's good. Uh, so, all right. You guys got anything, uh, Mason, Wes? No, but thank you for the congratulations. Yeah, we worked hard on that. <laughs> I believe we have certificates for him, right? Yes, we do. All right. I'll, yes, I'll get I him do. to them today. Hey, what I'd like to do is I'd like to read what it says on the certificate and then we'll present the certificates. And unfortunately, some of you aren't here for me to present them to you, but I will show them to you with your name on it. I'll get it for them. I'll give it to them <laughs> You'll make sure they get them, right? Um, it says certificate of achievement. The certificate is proudly presented to Mark um, and then it has the name. Thank you for, um, this one is to Martin Herman Flores. And it's thank you for coaching and supporting the College of the Desert team during the National Cyber League Spring 2023 competition season. Your dedication was invaluable. And uh, this is what it looks like. It's not a very good shot, but you will get this, okay? So I will have this. That's the first one. And congratulations. The next one is a certificate of achievement. This certificate is proudly presented to Julian Salazar. Congratulations on your outstanding performance during the National Cyber League Spring 2023 competition season. Yeah, Julian couldn't be here. I'm sorry. He's he got yeah. a job with one of us. We didn't even get to zoom him. Oh. So he's working. <laughs> but we have his certificate here. And then we have Martino Perez. You are here. Yeah. And this is your certificate of achievement. This certificate is proudly presented to Martino Perez. Congratulations on your outstanding performance during the National Cyber League Spring 2023 competition season. And do you want to turn forward? No. Give you this, and maybe we can pause after this for a picture. Oh, okay. We'll get it. In a, okay. Yeah, okay. we're not finished. It's okay. And there's some more. Um, we have another one, a certificate of achievement. This is the certificate of achievement is proudly presented to Mason Vega. Congratulations on your outstanding performance during the National Cyber League Spring 2023 competition season. So congratulations, Mason, and it's a pleasure to meet you today. And you best of you luck. Much. And the last one, Certificate of Achievement. This certificate is proudly presented to Wesley Rosenrod. Uh, congratulations on your outstanding performance during the National Cyber League Spring 2023 competition season. And again, a pleasure to meet you. And you have, we do have these here. And they will be presented by Dr. Felix to you, I'm sure. Um, so there we go. And I want to thank Dr. Felix and Professor Flores. Um, and a special thank you and congratulations to our amazing students. Professors, we recognize and commend your unwavering commitment to the growth and success of our students. And Dr. Uh, Professor Felix, it's been a pleasure working with you all these years, and I hope it goes on for many, many more. Thank you. Um, and to the students who were recognized in your achievements has not gone, gone unnoticed, and we are incredibly proud of your accomplishments. Just know that we are very, very proud of each and every one of you and everything that you're achieving, and we wish you the very, very best on your futures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to get a picture. So we're going to take a five-minute recess so that we can get that picture. Just five minutes.
You could recess to closed session if you wanted. Oh, we're going to closed session. So we'll do it then. Okay. So without any further ado, we're going to recess to closed session. The board will now recess to closed session. Um, the live feed of this meeting will continue. And let's try to be in closed session. And let's take um, 15 minutes. That would be, what time is it now? Ruben, I see you have your phone. So that would be... 11.06, 11.06, we will reconvene, okay? Thank you.
Um, we're going to reconvene to open session and there is um, no report out of any action taken in closed session. Right now we're up to consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda will be considered for an approval by a single vote without discussion. Any board member may request that an item be pulled from the consent agenda to be discussed and considered separately in the action agenda or yeah, action agenda. Are there any requests to separately consider any of the consent items? Madam Chair, huh? uh, 12.11, number four, do we consider for a separate vote? 12.11? Number four. Number four, section four? Yeah. Well, I think we have to pull 12.11 and then we'll pull that other part out of it. Okay. okay. Um, is, are there any other um, requests to separately consider any of the consent items? See no further ones. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented with 12.11 um, being pulled? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, and now um, we will have a roll call vote. President Garcia. Student Trustee Sarko. Yes. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Bettis. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And um, now we have pulled item 12.11 um, from the consent agenda. So we will take that one up separately. Um, do I have a motion to approve 12.11 as presented? So moved. It's been, the motion has been made. I'll acknowledge Trustee Kinman because I heard his voice very clearly. Um, and uh, the second was made by Somebody else tried to make the motion. Was that you, Mr. Oden? Trustee Oden? I'll make a second. Okay. And seconded by Trustee Oden. Um, is there any discussion? And I'll turn it over to um, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, first of all, Trustee Stefan, I know that um, it had been a request, and I, it was also requested during a gender review that mm -hmm. anytime that we have uh, this item, because of questions that have come up from myself and community members. Uh, we don't have any information that I saw um, on the agenda regarding the funds, right? I know I had requested uh, prior for us to show the public, you know, since we are uh, working on our efforts to be clear and transparent. Um, I know it was presented a few meetings ago uh, where the funding is being uh, moved from, which obviously includes projects that have already been earmarked for that funding. And I don't see that here. I was disappointed not to see that because again, um, it's important that we show because that money was not necessarily available and it's being uh, now redesignated. And uh, that's one, one issue. The other issue that I have is that I know that um, when I first was elected three years ago, um, there was a lot of conversation that somehow this design was already done and then it turned out that it wasn't, but I, I kept hearing like it's 50% already completed. Then as we all know, there was a upgraded design that didn't include the hotel and all that other fluffy stuff. Um, so that was another investment. And now here we are increasing it again with a whole another design. So it just seems to me, you know, I, I know there's a lot of conversation about uh, taxpayer dollars and bond money, which I'll remind everyone the bond is paid for throughout the Coachella Valley and not specific to 
to one city, one area. And so th those are those are my concerns is that I see this contract, uh, you know, at over five million dollars. And I saw some of the attachments where they're saying, OK, the, they're going to take the lead to DSA and all of that. But uh, for me, it just it doesn't sit well. One, we don't have any of the supporting documentation that had been requested. And I just really don't understand uh, why we're paying for all of these services ahead of time. It's almost like we are jumping over the process of approving things as they move along. And I definitely have an, an issue with that. Um, obviously, you all know and you've all heard, I still, uh, you know, I'm very concerned because the data uh, does not support that specific location in the West Valley, although I do believe and have always believed that the West End should have a campus as well. Um, even though our feasibility study didn't support the project uh, either. So I know those are multiple concerns, but I'm, I'm gonna challenge all of you as trustees to do the right thing here. You know, uh, I mean, I don't know, are all these millions of dollars going to cover costs of employees being hired, you know, through Moss? I don't know. But um, I would just, you know, I just have a lot of question about that because we've heard so many different variation stories of design being halfway done, not done, whatnot, and it just doesn't equal $5 million to me. And again, this definitely is going to uh, mean that money is being almost stolen, pulled from other projects that would benefit and improve access to different sectors of the community. So, you know, I just don't understand why there's such an effort not to be transparent when that supposedly is the goal. So those, those, are, those are my comments, my concerns. And again, I'm gonna challenge everyone to do the right thing here and to really take a look at, at where we should be in investing. I, Madam Chair, if I may, um, I also um, share those same concerns and I echo a lot of the sentiment that Trustee Gonzalez has as um, we are, this project is getting incrementally more and more expensive as we are, knew it would be happening. And we already had a, a design that was 100% complete scale with the scaled back campus that would have, we would have been able to afford without pulling different pots of money that was allocated and earmarked for different construction projects throughout the district. Um, I'd like to know where it is, and I'd like to get an answer from our staff, where it is that we're getting these $5 million from, are we pulling them, speci and specifically, which project is being affected? Are we pulling it from uh, the Mecca Thermal Campus, which has been historically um, underserved and underfunded? Or are we pulling in, are we pulling from uh, the Indio project, which was promised to those constituents as well, and to that city, um, because I'm getting phone calls from different city administrators that we're scaling back on some of the promises that we that we promised the city of Indio. So I'd really like to learn, um, get those questions answered from staff, where it is that we're putting, getting these pools of money from, and if they're not getting from specific bond projects, and if they're coming from RDA money, I want to caution our staff when using that, those dollars, because those dollars can be used for just about anything. And once we tap out of those dollars, we don't have anything um, to use as for, RDA related to use as we please. And we can use those for a whole gamut of different um, college related uh, services and issues. So um, if staff could please clarify those questions for me, and then I may have a few more points after that. Thank you. Okay, we have to go through the superintendent president. Superintendent President Garcia, could you have somebody share with us where the dollars are coming from? Yes, uh, and that will be done by both uh, VP Rod Garcia and Mac from Moss. I don't know if you guys want to move to the table so that you have a microphone and. And that is on as well, but here's an extra sticky. Oh. 
We on? All right. Good afternoon, trustees, Madam Chair. Let's let's start by being completely clear that the money for this particular arrange, uh, uh, amendment is already contained in the project budget. The $405.7 million that was allocated by the February action of this board covers that fund. So that money is not being taken from any other project. Okay. That's, that seems like the first salient point. After that, there were so many questions. Please, uh, please kind of tease them out for us a little bit so we can respond to them meaningfully one by one rather than just um, kind of laying out a whole bunch of words. Hey, uh, Trustee Gonzalez, can you ask one of the other questions that you had again? Yes, I, I hear you say that, but if you recall in the previous board meeting as well, it was in fact confirmed that there had been money moved specifically from Mecatron. Because I know there was some shock factors um, and I just kind of took a shot in the dark because that's where I saw some of the, the, the money that was there. So is your statement correct or incorrect? It is. And, and I will clarify the statement and hopefully that will help. The money that was allocated or earmarked for Mecca Thermal was never assigned to a specific project. At the level that the bond office operates at, all of the funds that we track are related to specific projects. Since there was no project designated for Mecca Thermal, we understood that to be an administrative move to simply uh, effectively move a number from one piggy bank to another. We do not have any awareness of any actual scope of work assigned to be paid for by that money. I hope that's a useful clarification. It's a lot of words, but I'm still hearing that the money was moved from there. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, growth there, which is not feasible because of the whole situation of there being uh, a septic tank versus connectivity. So I'm even, I know what, I hear what you're saying, but you are in essence saying that there was fund that was allocated there that was moved. I know what you're saying. You're, you're speaking construction terms. So there was no active project, but answer this question. The money was there and it was moved. If the district designated funds to be used in Mecca Thermal and then move them later, that's not an issue at the level of the bond office's authority. So that's not an issue that we can respond to. If the district had given us a specific project related to Mecca Thermal, then we'd be able to speak to it. Okay. Does anybody want to answer the question without construction terms? I don't know if that would be Dr. Garcia or yeah, would be... I, I could respond to it. Um, so as Robert stated, there was uh, an earmark of about $26 million um, in measure B um, that has been reduced to about $12 million. And that is for specifically earmarked for Mecca Thermal. But as Robert stated, there is no active project other than that funding, funding is still earmarked uh, as of now. I think that yes, I think that answers my question. Um, I, because the fact that it, it was, it, there was no project going on, but that set of pot of money was specifically set aside for the Mecca Thermal Campus, and we are reducing the pot of money that we have for any potential future projects at the Mecca Thermal Campus, and reallocating that to cover some costs per the resolution that was voted on by the majority of the board in February to cover some of the costs at our ever so more expensive Palm Springs project. Thank you. Would any other- I'm sorry, would you repeat the last part again, uh, Trustee Perez, that you said? Yeah, so I, what I said is that we had a pot of money that was through the, through the bond that was set aside for construct, future construction projects at the Thermal Mecca campus. Now we are pulling money that was set aside for future construction projects and using it now to cover the costs 
at the Palm Springs campus, which keeps on getting more and more expensive as we're deliberating. I understand that construction costs and all that stuff, but we also got to think about being equitable and understanding that these bond dollars are being paid for by the entire Coachella Valley, even the poor people that live in Mecca Thermal, despite the fact that they don't have huge properties and they're not paying as much as other folks that do have larger properties, they still own a part of the bond and therefore they should still have some money allocated that to them for future projects. That's the what I guess the essence of what I'm trying to get at here is that the money is everybody's. It's the it's the peoples on the eastern Coachella Valley as well as the ones on the western Coachella Valley. Let's make sure that we spread that equitably. Madam Chair. Yes. I certainly agree with that. As more than 17 years ago, when I was mayor of the city of Palm Springs, we negotiated specifically for a campus in Palm Springs that's not been built. But I have a real concern that we're talking about funds being moved from, from other projects as though one end of the valley is against the other. I think that's completely wrong. Um, we have students in the entire Coachella Valley and they all need to be served. And there are people who feel in one area in specifically in District 3, that nothing's been done for them since the project was approved. So I just think it's very dangerous. And well, let me ask um, the superintendent a question. And my question is, are there any monies being taken from one project that is designated through the Bond Act that's being applied to another project unfairly. Unfairly, um, that's a difficult question to answer, Trustee Oden, because you have to think about serving, as you stated, the entire community. Uh, the concern that I personally have is, um, when we were ensuring that the funds that were allocated through the resolution were allocated as specified, it was identified, as I stated, that we needed to reduce the earmarked dollars for Mecca Thermal uh, from 26 million to about 12 million. And then it was also identified in Measure CC that we need to come up with about $19 million to complete the two projects that could possibly be impacted are either Roadrunner Motors or uh, the athletic uh, uh, renovation project. So those are definitely concerning. Um, and yes, there are ADA, RDA dollars to cover them, um, but the resolution was very clear in regards to the specific allocation for Palm Springs. So when you think about moving or or having to come up with funding, whether it's through RDA or the other projects, I definitely have a concern about that because those projects were also committed. Are there any other questions? I, I concerns? Wait. What board discussions have you had about those and or with the community at large? with the funding. And I completely agree that we need a report on the funding, what's been done, what's been allocated to whatever projects that, because I, I think we need that. I think the community needs that. So I, I applaud you for requesting that. No question about it. I'm sorry, I could. No, no. I went off. <laughs> was it you? I yeah, like your words. He was going to say something. I mean, I think everybody wants transparency. And there, there are questions that I believe through the forensic audit will give us the answers. And I'm really relying on that because that's going through the books is the way we'll know whether there was 12.8 million originally designated for Mechathermal or whether it was a signed 
after the bonds have been passed and after the money was designated for other projects. There has been comments made that there were some special projects created by individuals on this board, which impacted money being shifted and that now money is being shifted back to where it was originally. Any other discussion? Yeah. <laughs> that's a, Gonzalez? That's an, that's an interesting comment, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. I'll just laugh about it. Um, let's not forget that even back when that original property, and I think that would have been a way better location, right? The north end of Palm Spring. Um, but the data back then didn't even support the project of that size. And the data hasn't changed much. We see where the numbers are. It's desert hot springs. It's a cathedral city, Palm Desert. Well, actually, it's Indio in order, Palm Desert, Coachella. So this, this is, this is what, what I'm referring to. Obviously, we had other options, right? Um, for those of you who, who watch our, our board meetings, um, there was a time where we were being given information where it had uh, funding earmarked or allocated to different projects. Then when uh, we asked Dr. Garcia to take a closer look at it, and she did, then we found that there were numbers on a sheet, but there was no real allocation. So if we really want to get into tit for tat and transparency, this all occurred prior to her leadership. But again, I'm not going to use this space for that. But um, I am definitely concerned because, again, I'm going back to the same thing. We've all been told and it's been hammered and on fake websites and all this nonsense going on that somehow this project was already complete, had been shown around town during Modernism Week and all this stuff. Then, again, we did a second one that was a scaled down version that was a little more in line with what the feasibility, the true feasibility study so not one that had components of it. And here we are with, all, not, and we even assembled um, a group of folks that each one of us assigned two people to that were going to meetings to talk about the design and all of that went out the door. I even had one person who I appointed say to me, then what did I miss work for to go to these meetings when you guys are just redoing all of this? So if you ask me, has there been a waste of money? Absolutely. But why is that? Why do we continue to funnel all this money to certain, you know, entities? And I just, it, it doesn't make sense to me. There's something going on here. And I know a lot of fingers point one way, but I think we have a case of look over there and not over here going on here. Because there was definitely options. And there was the former president that actually went and made promises at city council meetings and in meetings with elected officials. Madam Chair. And, and here we are. Madam Chair, I uh, am offended by the, her inaccurate framing of what took place. She wasn't there. Well, I'm she offended by part, you insinuating that board part, members have pet projects. And So do we want to go there? I do want to go there. Excuse me. We're going to have order. If anybody doesn't have anything new to share without accusations, then we're going to bring this to a vote. Does anybody have anything new they'd like to share with no accusations, please? Okay. Um, I think certain, certainly everyone has a lot of questions. And I'm sure I probably had the most since I'm the newest. <laughs> but, um, and hopefully the audit will clarify all of those things. Um, and, and so, so thank you for requesting the clarification. I appreciate it. So when you say the audit will uh, shed light, what are you, are we asking to table this item then? Or what are we doing? No, I wasn't asking to table it um, because there has been a request for an audit already, has there not? We have um, the process. The forensic audit is in the process now as we speak. Do we have an, any updates on when we can expect a presentation? 
Um, no, not yet. Um, the other thing is um, information was requested that was not brought forward uh, for this meeting that uh, we had requested. I the I, I'm going to ask uh, Trustee Gonzalez. Um, you requested that information. You, do you need that information to make your decision today? Yes. Okay. Do you want to make an amendment to this or do you, you want to um, have us vote on this first? If we, wait, let me ask my parliamentarian first. Parliamentarian, we have a motion on the floor. Do we need to take action on this motion? Yeah. So what the what I've gathered from the conversation is specific to one section of the item. So my recommendation would be that you move to divide the question and pull that one out as you've done in the past so that you can dispose of the other and then make a decision. And then come back to that one for another decision. Right. It sounds like that would solve it. Otherwise, you would be taking currently action on the entire 12.11. Entire I, I, would, I would call for the vote. And the question has been called, a vote has been, a request for a vote has been called. Is that just an immediate action then? So we may can um, vote on the whole. Um... Sure. So anytime a, a motion limits the uh, rights of the members, it requires a two thirds majority vote. So if you call the question, it requires a second, and then you must take a vote to call the question and it requires a two thirds majority vote. Okay, so um, the motion has been made to call the vote. Is there a second? Seeing none, the motion to call the vote. So now we're back to the uh, original motion and what we want to do with that. And it there is a recommendation that we separate out the one item that is under um, that's being questioned from the rest and vote on the rest. Is that correct? Right, you would be uh, dividing the motion into two. Two sections. Mm -hmm. So there would be everything except for the one section that you're questioning. That was section four. Well, I when I pulled it, I did. Yeah, but we can't it be considered for a separate vote. We can't, we didn't, we pulled it. And then when it came up for a motion, the motion was just made on the whole thing. When you pull it, you cannot request it to be pulled that way. You know, you, you're not making the motion at that point. But right now, the motion on the floor is for the entire thing. If you want to, you can amend the motion that's on the floor to have section four pulled and we vote on the rest of the motion and vote on section four separately, right? Correct, so um, you would- That's what you'd really like to do, is that correct, Trustee Gonzalez? I got a little lost. <laughs> Carlos? Yeah, yeah, sure. So currently, 12.11 uh, has four items in it. Um, and when you pull something from consent, you have to pull the entirety of the item. So that's why all four had to come out. But now that it's the motion on the table is to adopt 12.11. And it sounds like from the conversation that we've only talked about specifically 12.11.4. So if you wanted to act on the whole thing, then it would approve or or not approve all four. But what I'm suggesting is based on the conversation, you may want to divide. So you would pull items one, two, three separately and then deal with four on its own. Okay, that's what I thought I had done when I when I mentioned that I wanted it to be considered. But separately. when you when you pulled it originally, you can only pull because you're pulling it out yeah. of the whole thing. You can only pull the whole thing out of that. You can't just pull one section out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you want to divide that, right? Okay, so now we're um, dividing sections one, two, three as one part and section four will be considered separately. Uh, do I have a second for that? Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we take one, two, three separately from section four and we approve sections one, two, three. Is there discussion on that? Seeing none, let's have a roll call vote on sections one, two, three of um, item 12.11, please. Student trustee Sarko. Aye. Trustee Oden. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. 
Trustee Perez. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Now we still have one item left. Do you want to make a motion to consider that? Um, and it can be to consider it or to postpone it or to whatever. I move for approval of item four. Okay. Motion to table, item four. I'll second that motion. Table. Uh, so Madam Chair, it's up to you now. You uh, decide which motion you will accept. You have a motion to. Well, that approve. motion was made before the ta to table and the other one. Correct. The motion on the table was to approve 12.11 in its entirety. And so when you move to divide, yeah, the divide. motion on the table would be to approve 12.11, um, 1, 2, and 3, and then to approve 12.11. I thought we right. items. But that motion, the, the motion carries to both items. So the only thing that's in order as an option is to recognize either that it's going to be approved and move forward in that discussion or to recognize Trustee Gonzalez, uh, Perez's item to table because that is also a, an appropriate motion at this time. So right now the item you have on the table is to approve 12.11.4, right? Yeah, we already approved one, two, three. Correct. Okay. So now the motion on the table is to approve 12.11.4. So the discussion would be that along those lines, Trustee Perez has in, requested to post, uh, to, excuse me, to table. table. That is an appropriate motion. It sounded like Trustee Gonzalez seconded, seconded, correct? So now if you recognize that, then you go down the road of talking about tabling. Okay. Okay. Because we have a first and a second on that. So we have to consider that because we only had a first. On correct. That. And Trustee Kinnaman's motion was not necessary because that was already on the table. Okay. Okay, so um, to table, any discussion on this? Uh, yes, I, we keep hearing people say they do not want to see costs continue to go up, and yet they continue to do, delay the project, which makes project the project costs go up. So it's counterintuitive to listen to that argument. Um, I'm going to ask staff. Oh, to can we go through the chair? Yes, ma'am. You want to participate, <clears throat> Trustee Perez. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to ask our staff to get a little creative and bring back um, solutions as to how it is that we may be able to um, cover the costs of these projects without um, taking funding from money that should be used elsewhere. Is there any further discussion? I, I really would just, Trustee Gonzalez, yes, if I may, I really would like to see it because I still have that question. You know, when, when I first came on the board, supposedly the design was done and then it wasn't and then we invested it. So I know I've asked this before and I don't know that we actually have a, a true accounting of, you know, how many times have we done the schematic design? How many committees? I mean, we even had one going on and that's been just completely, you know, bulldozed over. So I still stand firm on that. We need to take a deeper dive into this and it, it really does need to stop. And again, I'm not opposing a West Valley campus, but for God's sakes, you know, um, I know we heard earlier that it's only a 20 minute bus ride. Well, I, I actually had an opportunity thanks to a friend of mine that introduced me to a student that is from Desert Hot Springs. And they explained their day to me and it wasn't that simple. They are taking a bus here, then they have to find something to do because it takes too long to go back home while they're waiting for their next class to start. They're incurring costs because now they're, they're having to buy food or whatnot. So there's a whole lot more than just a, a 15 minute bus right here. You know, I know it, it sounds good when you hear it, but that's not that's not reality. So I still stand firm in that we should table this and really take a deeper dive into this. Madam Chair, if I can, um, I'm a student, you know, from Indio, and I've you know been take the bus from Indio to here. It could be from 30 to 40 minutes, and I could imagine Desert Hot Springs being an issue of trying to get the bus from there to here. You know, 
my sister works at Eisenhower and she has to go all the way to India and she explains how she has to take two buses, which could be an hour and 20 minutes at some times. So students should be able to have easy access to these locations and education at their hands instead of, you know, pushing a lot of time out because of a bus ride. Okay, anybody else want to chime in? Trustee Odin? Right now we have a motion on to table this. And could I ask, um, President Garcia, um, let's look up, I don't know why. Um, President Garcia, could you explain to us exactly what it is we would be tabling? You would be tabling the contract that would help us to continue move forward with the project um, in alignment with the new timeline. Um, and I, I do want to take the opportunity to recognize that uh, Trustee Gonzalez requested that information. However, our new VP uh, of Administrative Services is trying to understand uh, the expenses related to both bonds, and he is getting a report ready to present to the board, but you are impacting uh, the project moving forward. Um, but as I stated, the information that was requested was not provided because BP Garcia is getting familiar with the budgets and expenses for both bonds. And the, the project that we're talking about specifically, is that the one that the meeting was on yesterday? Correct. So you're specifically impacting the Palm Springs development project. Okay. So is there any further discussion at this time? This is a motion that um, we're looking at is to table this project um, and there's no deadline date, right? That could make it indefinite. So um, is there uh, any further discussion at this time? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Student trustee Sarko. It's to table. Uh, I'm sorry, can I get an elaboration just one more time exactly what I'm voting on? Yes. Um, what this is, this is a motion to table this section four, which is the Palm Springs campus. Um, and there's no deadline date. There's nothing that we're tabling it specifically for. It's just a motion to table um, at this time. And that's basically what it is. It would table. It would freeze everything in the Palm Springs. But there's no date set. I'm going to say yes. Okay. Did you hear that, uh, President Garcia? Yes. Student, oh, thank you, trustee, uh, student trustee circle. Trustee Odin? No. Trustee Kinnaman? No. Trustee Perez? Uh, yes, but if I may, Madam Chair, with a little explanation, the reason why I'm voting yes is because, and it's not to create more delays, it's just because all of our constituency is paying for this bond and the way it's being distributed, it's not equitable for all of our constituents. So it's not to make create more delays. I'm just simply asking our staff to get a little creative as to how it is that we're moving money around. Thank you. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes, I vote to table. And Trustee Stefan. I'm voting no, because I think we've delayed enough. And I think that we can get creative at the same time for the next month and bring back all those figures and things that we have been requesting. Motion fails. Okay, so right now we have um, the motion to table has failed. Is there a new motion for section four? Uh, 
Madam Chair, the, the motion on the table is to approve. This table failed. So you go back to the previous. Oh, okay. so it goes back to the previous one. Okay. So now the motion on the table is to approve section four. Is there a second? Second. There's already a second, ma'am. I'll, I'll make the oh, motion. No, there wasn't a second. Yeah. So when you originally put it on uh, the oh. agenda, it was moved by um, Trustee Kinnaman and seconded by uh, Trustee Odin. Oh, very, they're very, 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 very early on. But that was before we divided. Correct. But okay. that motion still carries. Okay. So yeah. that one's still there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's been moved and seconded to approve this. Is there um, any more discussion? I would just, if I may mention, I would just like to state that I will not ever vote on something that I know is going to put the college in the financial situation that we have already been warned that is going to happen. And I just want my you know, constituents and all the students to know that I fought the good fight. I'm you know, doing the best I can to ensure that there's equity and accessibility to all. But, you know, majority rules, but I'm going to stand where I stand and vote no. Any further discussion? I would like to say something. I've been on this board for 24 years. I was here when we passed the first bond measure. I was here when we passed the second bond measure. And um, it was always the intent that the money would be divided throughout the valley. Different things happened throughout that time that precluded us from spending money in areas where we wanted to spend it at the time. And hopefully today, I know there was a meeting over in Mechathermal area um, with the water district, looking at infrastructure of water and sewage systems. And I would hope that something moved finally in that direction over there today. I don't know what's going on over there with that meeting, um, but I will be looking into it when I get home tonight. Um, the other thing is, um, the longer we delay, the more things go up. The more things go up, the less we're able to do. And I know that when we were looking at the Indio campus originally, that very first building, that it was brought to the board that we would never fill that up within 10 years. The day that we dedicated that building, we knew we were beyond capacity. The day we opened the doors, we were way beyond capacity and we were criticized throughout the valley because we had not built it larger. We built it as large as the state of California would allow us. So I don't have a crystal ball, but I'll tell you, if, um, if we build it, and I said it then about Indio, and I believe it about every campus that we could build in this valley, if we build it, they will come. It's like with the baseball game, the movie that they made. And I really believe we'll be able to fill up that campus. And um, if we work harder, we need to get creative with the, the buses. Originally, we could not get a student from the Salton Sea or the Coachella end of the valley anywhere over to this campus. When we opened up the Indio campus, we were able to get more bus service. No, it's not a good thing. It takes forever. Trust me, I had car damage and I had to take my car to Big O in Cathedral City and I had to get home to Indio. It took me half a day and I had to walk from bus station to bus station because I didn't know where they were and what the times were. And um, that's ridiculous. But that's the way it is right now in the Valley. But we can work with the buses. We've worked with them before and we can get things different. Or maybe we can come up with something that's more creative, a better system. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and vote to move forward with this because I think we owe it to everyone in the Valley. We have special projects that we want to um, have at that Palm Springs campus, and we need to get them going because there are students throughout this valley that will benefit. If we have to get our own van service going or our own bus service, so be it. Let's do that so that anybody that wants to go to that campus and get trained can do it. It's like getting the nursing students here to the main campus. If we have to get a bus service to bring students in, let's do it. I know I've driven up to Desert Hot Springs to help students out and bring them down to this campus and driven them myself in my own clunky cars. So, um, you know, we can do a lot of things, people, but we have to get together and we have to figure out what to do. And being creative, Trustee Perez, 
I think that's the best solution in the world. Let's figure out what we can do to make it work. Okay. Can I make one final yes. suggestion? I just uh, wanted to point out um, regarding the, the meeting that's going on um, to with the water district. So uh, I know that in previous meetings, we actually had access to minutes and whatnot, where back then, I believe it was, was it 8 million, Ruben? Do you remember from the documentation? It was minutes of the, the meetings back then, community meetings. <laughs> I think there was an $8 million fee to connect to the sewer and this college at that time. But it uh, wasn't in the middle of the street. It was way over. Well, regardless, though, yeah. but <laughs> that investment there back then, which I'm sure is not $8 million anymore, <laughs> would have allowed for an expansion and for courses to be offered at that campus that are actually what the community needs and not what the college thinks that the community uh, wanted. So, you know, just just point of clarification, right, um, where, you know, the, this this discussion could go on for a really, really long time. I just, uh, you know, again, really appreciated the model that was presented to us where we had a city that was willing to, um, you know, donate a portion of the surrounding businesses taxes to support the college. Even after, you know, we we're hoping if you build it, they will come. But if they don't, then, you know, just you know, for me, it's going to be good because the record will, will, you know, show that I was responsible and I voted responsibly, but neither here nor there. Like I said, majority rules and I stand where I stand. Chair Stephanie, can I uh, correct my colleague? There was not $8 million set aside and it may have been a cost of, but we tried to work with the county supervisor and his chief of staff and others to address that issue. And they were unable to help us get, get through the red tape to, to get to Mecca Thermal with, with infrastructure. Yeah, minutes indicate otherwise, but that's this. I'd love to see him. Why don't you shoot a copy of it to me? This isn't the space, right? Yes. You're in the middle of discussion about this yeah. item. No, we were still yeah. discussing. Discussion on the vote. If I could, Madam Chair. <laughs> I take this position here quite seriously. There's a biblical passage that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. We had a, a vision, and, and I'm dealing with constituents who still see that vision very vividly. And initially, to show the commitment from the city, we purchased the land up to, I think it was $5 million to support what was the vision at that time. So there's a commitment. And not only do I know there's a commitment, it's my responsibility to go back to the, my constituents and where there is a shortfall, we'll have to assume that. And they'll have to assume the, the responsibility of helping us fill those classrooms. So. I'm not shying away from the commitment any way at all. And I'm assuming the responsibility to make sure that it happens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there anything else? Okay, let's uh, get a, if there's no further discussion, uh, let's call, do a roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Circle. Oh, does anybody want me to repeat the question? What we're voting on is to approve section four of this to move forward with the Palm Springs plans. Okay. Did you want to, you know what you're voting on? Okay. Um, aye. Okay. Um, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. And, and you stated I, just to be correct. Uh, Trustee Odin? Aye. Trustee Kinneman? Aye. Trustee Perez? Not voting. Uh, Trustee Gonzalez? No. Trustee Stefan? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Um, this brings us on to... Uh, Madam Chair, if I could clarify, Trustee Perez, did you say uh, I abstain? Thank you. 
Okay, this brings us to action agenda item 15.01. This is the um, employment agreement for the interim superintendent president. It is now time to consider item 15.01 on the agenda, wherein it is recommended that the board approve the employment agreement for the interim superintendent president. The board has offered the position of interim superintendent president to Laura Hope, who is currently serving as associate superintendent of instruction and instructional effectiveness at the Chafee Community College District. The board made the offer to Ms. Hope after conducting interviews with four candidates for the position at the board's June 1st uh, special board meeting. Ms. Hope comes to College of the Desert with 34 years of experience in the California Community College system, working as a community college faculty member, academic dean, executive vice chancellor, and associate superintendent. Throughout her career, Hope has led a number of innovative efforts at Chafee College in Rancho Cucamonga, including the uh, Puente Project, Turning Point, an associate's degree program in the California Institution for Women and the California Institution for Men, Chafee's Success Center Network, the Faculty Success Center, and Classified Success Network. In August 2017, Hope began serving as Executive Vice Chancellor for Educational Services at the California Community College's Chancellor's Office in Sacramento. During that time, she introduced and led major reforms including Guided Pathways, the Student-Centered Funding Formula, the Student Equity and Achievement Program, and AB 705 Implementation, among other efforts. In 2019, she returned to Chafee College to advance developmental education reforms, Guided Pathways, Implementation, Dual Enrollment, and Distance Education Expansion, Improve Equitable Hiring Practices, and Enrollment Systems. She is also on the leadership team to implement the construction of two new campus sites, including a brand new campus in Ontario, California, and the flagship building on the Rancho Cucamonga campus. The library and learning commons, which will house the library, success centers, faculty success center, and the innovation center. Beyond her scope as a college leader, Laura Hope also serves as the Inland Empire Region 9 Chief Instructional Officer, representative of the statewide CIO board. She serves on the Learning Lab Board, serving California Community College Foundation. She was a uh, founding leader for RP Group's effort, Leading the Middle, co-authored the textbook published by Josie Bass titled Student Success in Community Colleges, a Practical Guide to Developmental Education, which won the Merits Award for Research from the RP Group, and she served on the Executive Board for the Inland Empire Desert Regional Consortium, supporting work-based learning and employment growth. This recommended action will approve the employment agreement between the district and Ms. Hope with her employment commencing on July 1, 2023, pursuant to Government Code Section 54953C, a summary of the terms of the agreement include an annual salary of $355,000, a $1,000 a monthly housing allowance as Ms. Hope will be securing temporary housing in the Coachella Valley during the term of her employment agreement, sick leave of one day per month, 23 days annually of vacation with pay, 12 days annually of general leave, and the same medical health and welfare benefits as other administrative personnel. Do I have a motion to approve item 15.01 as presented? So moved. It's been moved to approve this um, item. Is there a second? I'll suck it. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none. If, sure if I may, I oh, okay, want to thank um, our council for all the great work that she did in getting us to this place. Um, she worked long hours and I really appreciate her, her good work. Thank you. And I would like to also thank the trustees for the time and effort that everyone put into this effort working together. Thank you, everyone. Anyone else?
Um, if we could have a roll call vote, please, President Garcia. Student Trustee Circle. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Perez. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, next item is 16.01, public employee appointment, academic directors and executive directors. It is now time to consider item, oh, wait a minute, we pulled, uh, this yeah. has been knocked off. All, all, item, all, all item 16, so we'll go straight to 17.01. I didn't cross it off my list. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Big mess up here. 17.01. one. Okay, here we are. Okay, um, 17.01, budget revisions. Do I have a motion to approve item 17.01 as presented? This is budget. So Thank you. Is there a okay. second? And a second by Trustee Odin. Thank you, Trustee Perez, for making that motion. Um, is there any discussion? Discussion. Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Student Trustee Sarko. Aye. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Aye. Trustee Perez. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, President Garcia. Um, next item is 17.02, 2023-2024 tentative budget. Before we take action, I'd like to invite Rodrigo Garcia, Vice President of Administrative Services, and Diana Gojaro, Interim Director of Fiscal Services, to present item 22.02. And guy, you guys are boom, right there. <laughs> Magic. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to thank Dean and the students for their presentation earlier. It was uh, very informative and, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a really important topic. But with that, we're going to go ahead and start with the tentative budget. The tentative budget is really a rollover budget for the district in order to continue operation while we continue closing the books. So normally for us, we're closing the books throughout July, and then we're doing budget development for a proposed budget during August, and we will bring the, the actual proposed budget to the board in September. So basically this just so we could continue operations. Um, with that, you want me to have a click or just, sorry. I got, can we run to the table so quick? <laughs> I don't know if it's working. Okay, can we go back one slide, please? There we go. Okay, thank you. So overall economic uh, backdrop. So overall economic continues to decline. The state revenue right now is uh, lower than we anticipated in January. The actual budget deficit for the state um, increased to $31.5 billion. You know, some of the factors for that is Inflation, downturn in stock market, primarily technology, high interest rates, real estate slowdown. Some of the other items that we have to also think about this is this is looking at revenue, anticipating revenue. And although we did have, you can see here in 2022, uh, tax filing deadlines were delayed in certain counties from April to October. So although they're estimating revenues, they're still not quite sure what the revenues will be until all that income um, uh, income revenue comes in in October. So that's still an unknown factor. Next slide, please. So the state budget, uh, Prop 98 was reduced from prior year by $68 million. $52 million of that is for con community colleges. Um, there is an ongoing investment uh, for COLA of 8.22%. Um, a portion, uh, only certain handful of categoricals 
have that COLA applied to them. As you can see here is adult ed, EOPS, DSPS, CalWORKs, uh, child care. They're, the state and the chancellor's office is working on uh, with the, the governor to see if COLA can be um, included with all categoricals, but at this point in time is only for these specific um, categorical programs. There is additional funding, uh, I'm sorry, the, so there's a half a percent of growth for the student funding center funding formula. There's only a couple new items for new revenue. One of them is the LGBTQ plus pilot program. There's $10 million set aside statewide um, uh, for this program. There's also an increase of $4.2 million for the equal opportunity program. And all these numbers are statewide numbers. So just so you have a reference, when I'm referencing statewide numbers, usually for College of the Desert, it's about 0.9% of that number. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so some of the one-time funds that uh, is being allocated is there is $100 million for retention and re-enrollment strategies. Last year, there was $150 million uh, earmarked to community colleges. Um, so although it went down by $50 million statewide, they're still um, including uh, an additional $100 million for this year. There is $14 million for workforce uh, training program. One of the biggest impacts that we're having right now is deferred maintenance, which also includes instructional equipment and COVID-19 block grant. For 23-24, that has been completely eliminated. So there's no funding uh, for either of those categories. And to make things worse, for 22-23, the funds that we were allocated for this year, they're actually rolling back over 50% of it. So as you can see here for deferred maintenance is about 452 million. For COVID-19 block grant is 344 million. And what that means to College of the Desert is a little bit over 4 million for deferred maintenance, and a little bit over 3 million for COVID-19 block grant. That's another thing that the chancellor's office in the league is working with the governor to see if instead of rolling them back, which means a lot of these funds, and you'll see in the numbers later, there the numbers were the amounts that we received were so big there's probably hardly any community college in the state that actually spent all the money. So where you're asking them to give money back that they've already spent. Um, but what they're trying to work is if they could defer these funds. So instead of not just cutting them and rolling them back is not paying them out for this year and just paying them out for the following year. So that's still in, in conversations. So with that, we can go to the next slide. So these are the assumptions that we took for the College of the Desert budget for 23-24. So cost of living adjustment of 8.13. As you notice in my previous slides, it was 8.22. During the budget development, all we knew was of 8.13. When we found out about the 8.22, it was so far into the process that we didn't feel it was efficient to go back and change all the numbers. But if 8.22 sticks by June 30th, that will be incorporated or whatever the number will be, will be incorporated into the adopted budget in September. Uh, at this point, we are budgeting no growth, um, so funding remains flat. There is an increase to PERS, and we're still continuing to monitor the 50% law where we're having some challenges with. So some of the assumptions that we use for the uh, projected years is for 24-25, uh, uh, using the school service dartboard, they have a statute, an estimated start, statutory call of 3.54. That was incorporated for 2526, although there is a statutory a COLA estimated, of course, because until we get to the year, we really don't know what the COLA is going to be. Um, we um, didn't estimate any COLA. And the reason for that is based on the new funding formula, after 2425, if the, any college does not reach the same funding level, and that doesn't necessarily mean just FTS, but dollar amount that you are previous or you're currently funded at, at 2425, the district, even if there is a statutory COLA at the state level and in the system, those districts will not receive that COLA. So that was one of the stipulations. So those are things that we're going to have to keep a, uh, an eye out when, when we're um, getting to 2526. So we did not, at this point in time, incorporate COLA in revenues or expenses. Um, and again, no growth beyond COLA for 24-25. Uh, uh, maintaining middle college and center status for 23-24, we've 
we kept it there and on the uh, following years as well. But that's something else that we're going to have to keep an eye out because starting in 23, 24, they will re-bench where we're at. So basically wherever, whatever we report. So at this point in time, middle college is 10,000 FTS and above. Center status is 1,000 FTS and above. At this point in time, if we look at our numbers for this current year, 20, uh, 22, 23, we are below both those numbers. It doesn't affect us this year because we're under the emergency provision, but starting next year, if we are if we report below those numbers, we will have three years in order to uh, actually increase above those numbers. If we don't um, increase within the next three years, what that means is that we would be recategorized to a smaller college and we would actually lose our st center status at Indio. And what that would be mean is about $1.9 million for each of those. So potentially it could be a, a close to $4 million decrease in our base allocation if we don't get back to those um, numbers. The good thing about this is that it does not take a three-year average like our other funding. As long as you're above those numbers, you're good. So we'll have three years to get above that. And uh, based on the numbers that I've been seeing, we're trending up, which is a good thing. Uh, STRS rates projected to level off after 23, 24, and PERS rates continue to increase slightly throughout the following years. Right. Yes. Just a quick, quick question before I forget it and you move on. Um, for that emergency provision, if we dip down one year, or if we dip down next year, right, and we're, we have those three years, if we go up one, that if we go up to, to maintain center status that next year, and then for whatever reason we lose enrollment, that the year after that, does it start back over again or yes. it does? Yes, okay. so it does. You don't want to automatically drop. So it's kind of like a, a lot of college, you will see when that's how they're doing the borrowing of summer, but yes. So as long as you're up, that time period starts again, the three-year period. If we can go back to the, there we go. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So as you can see here, so here's a, you know, 20,000 uh, foot level picture of our general fund. So as you can see here, <clears throat> unrestricted funds, we are just uh, budgeting a very, very small deficit of a little bit over $10,000. The restricted funds looks a little weird in the sense of the, you see a $2.6 million deficit. The reason for that is what I mentioned before. So we received a, a significant amount of money in COVID-19 block grant last year. So all the revenue was recognized in this current year. All those funds were not spent. So we carry forward the expenses, but not the revenue. So that's why it looks like we're overspending because truly we received all the funds this year. But since we haven't spent them, we have to continue taking the budgets of the expense side for the following years to keep spending. So that's the reason for the, the big deficit as far as budgeted. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we focus on unrestricted. So that blue column that you see there, again, I wanna state this is estimated actuals. So that $3.2 million of um, surplus is uh, uh, an estimate because we haven't finished with all the expenditures in June and we still haven't done all the closing entries that we need to do throughout July. So that's uh, to be determined. But once we have that information, we'll be able to roll the carryover balance. And But that doesn't really change our 23-24 tenanted budget. And as you can see there in 24-25, the projected budget includes in revenues and expenses the, the 8.13 COLA. The reason you see a $1.7 million deficit there is because the expenses also include step and column increases um, that obviously are not supported by COLA. Um, and for our district, that's about 1.9% 1, 1 increase um, in, in average. So that's why you see that difference. And then moving forward for 25, 26, we did not incorporate COLA, but you can see our deficit continues to grow because we continue to incur the step and column increases um, for our expenses. Um, so that's why you see that, that number. And again, all these numbers are projections with us not growing. If we end up growing, these numbers will be better as far as the deficit um, is concerned. Uh, next slide, please. So it's just some budget highlights. Uh, you know, reductions in revenues uh, are more than we previously anticipated in January. Funding for K-12s and community colleges continue to decrease. There's a significant reduction in one-time funds. 
Um, some of our risks are obviously enrollment decline, a possible loss of middle college and uh, status of our center status, um, and a possible recession. You know, we never we never know. Um, next slide, please. So this is just I wanted to give the board just a high level uh, picture of you know our past history for FTS. So as you can see here, well I can't read it from here, but we're a little bit over 1,400 FTS uh, lower than we were in 1920. So all these numbers represent annual. So the actual FTS that we uh, claimed, other than that last column, the last column is P2 because we haven't reported annual yet. So at this point, um, we are for a little bit of 1,442 FTS lower than we were in 1920 at annual, which was... Uh, 10,732. But one of the things that I want to share with you is that our Emergency Provision Act is what it actually funds us at is at P1 of 1920. So P1 of 1920 was actually even higher than that 10,000. It was 11,272, I believe. So that's the benchmark that we're looking at uh, in order to be able to reach that goal in order to get COLA. And again, it's not solely based on FTS, because really what they're looking at is a dollar amount, not FTS. And as we know, our funding is not just based on FTS. And even if it was, FTS has a lot of different categories. There's credit, non-credit, enhanced credit. And it depends what uh, the students that we serve, their socioeconomics, their, um, their success rates. There's a lot of different components that will get us to that dollar amount. So there's a lot of different ways we can strategize to get that dollar amount up without necessarily only looking at increase of FTS. Uh, next slide, please. So the budget process, as I mentioned before, there was a January uh, budget uh, from the governor. There was a May revise, just happened last month. Uh, through May and June, the legislation starts negotiating on what was in the May revise. Hopefully by today, they should be, uh, the House and the Senate should be reconciling those differences. You know, we are here today to adopt the, the uh, tentative budget. Uh, on June 30th, uh, the, or before, the governor will adopt the state budget. And from July, moving forward, there's going to be a lot of trailer bills. Um, and then we will bring the budget to the board on September 15th. A lot of things that we need to understand is that although the budget is adopted June 30th, there is still a lot of work and a lot of information that the state still has to do to give us information. So although it's adopted June 30th, a lot of times we don't get the actual detailed information until September or past. Uh, next slide, please. So final thoughts, you know, unprecedented time continues for community colleges. Um, you know, the state budget details are still being worked out, as I mentioned. So our single focus is gonna be enrollment. Um, and again, that doesn't necessarily mean just get more students here. It also means student retention. It also means uh, converting part-time students to full-time students to help their um, success rates. So there's a lot of different ways we could look at our enrollment, uh, not just by getting you know, more headcount on campus. So with that, I think that is the last slide. I wanna, before I ask for questions, I wanna thank Diana and her staff they did all the heavy lifting. I've been here for a month, so I just stepped in. So they did all the work. I want to thank her and her staff for everything that they did to put the budget together. So with that, I'll leave thank it Thank you, um, Vice President Garcia and Diana. Are there any questions from the board at this time? We'll start over here with trustee, um, student trustee Zarco. Do you have any questions? So you mentioned enrollment as overall right not specifically online or in person it's the whole thing right correct okay and that means credit non-credit enhanced credit everything okay thank you okay uh trustee perez thank you madam chair uh thank you vp garcia and um miss uh Yaharo for that awesome presentation um i have a couple questions related to the um funding opportunities that are out there um, are those uh, one-time like grant competitive grant applications or are they um, like a, a one for all type deal? 
So it depends. So most, so when we're focusing, you know, primarily when we focus on the budgets, usually the unrestricted funds, which means it's just apportionment, uh, our property tax. So the funding that you're talking about is more on the restricted side. So when you saw those two columns, uh, that could be a lot of different things. There's grants that are five-year grants, there's grants that are yearly grants. There are a lot of different things that we could bring in to enhance uh, our student support, uh, uh, student enhancement, a lot of different things. I guess specifically what I'm um, uh, wondering about is like the LGBTQ plus uh, dollars that are out there. Are those competitive? Uh, no, so they're going to be based on FTS. Okay. So what the state's going to do is they're going to, uh, not every grant's like that, but usually the grants that come from the state are based on a formula and usually they're driven by FTS. I see. Okay, thank you. So that's why I say a lot of times when we're putting out state numbers, usually what I would do is take 0.9% of that number. And that's usually fairly close what College of the Desert would get. Mr. Gonzalez? No, I, I had a similar question, but that, that was the answer. Because I know a lot of the conferences that we've been to, especially the ones up in, in D.C., there's a lot of grants. Yeah, lot of for, for the there. most part, anything that comes from the chancellor's office as far as categoricals that we're not actually applying for usually comes by FTS basis. Thank you, and thank you for the thorough presentation. Thank you thank and your you. team. Yeah. Trustee Odin, questions? Well, I, I probably would have had a lot of questions, <laughs> but I went over um, a lot of this yesterday with President uh, Garcia, so she really helped me, but thank you. You did clarify a few points that I had uh, some concerns about, so thank you. Trustee Kinman. Thank you. Okay, I've got a couple. Um, and you might have touched on this, but I just um, want to go back and see if you can give me a little more inf insight in this. Um, at the last conference I was at, they said hold harmless could go away you know, if things were really bad in the state. Um, now, I don't know if that will happen, and we're going to always hope that nothing bad ever happens. But if that does, what should our FTES be? So just to be clear. So that we aren't in yeah. trouble. So in the, unfortunately, unlike K-12s, we do not have, community colleges do not have automatic backfill. Mm -hmm. So K-12s get backfilled no matter what. Um, so there is always, right, regardless of hold harmless, there's always a risk of deficit at the state. And they're, you know, they'll do a deficit factor across the state and basically cut every single college other than the basic aid districts. Um, our college is actually not on hold harmless. So um, if you look, hold harmless is based on the revenue that you were generating in uh, 17, 18, I believe. And since 17, 18, we've actually grown. Um, so our district is not in hold harmless, but we are being funded at that emergency provision amount. So okay. it's not going to be necessarily an FTS target that we're shooting for. It's a dollar amount that we're shooting for. So there's a, our FTS and all the uh, different components that I mentioned all calculate to a TCR, which is our total computational revenue. That's the number that we need to surpass. And that could be a, a many different ways of combinations. Like I said, it could be, because um, we could grow in FTS a lot, but if we grow in the wrong, like let's say we grow in non-credit, well, non-credit is significantly lower rate than credit or at a hands credit. So we could actually grow in um, FTS but not really get additional funding because that rate's not there. So it all depends where we grow. It also who the students that we're serving. During the pandemic, we actually lost a lot of our uh, um, marginally impact students. Those students count higher when we serve them because based on PAL, AB 540, a lot of, you know, they're higher in the rate. If, so if we could get those students back, that would be an enhancement to our formula. So the formula is very tricky because it all depends what FTS are you growing? What students are you actually serving? And, and their outcomes, you know, how are they getting through the system? So, so the main goal is me working with uh, VP of Student Services and VP of Instruction and soon our new um, interim superintendent will be is, you know, our strategies to how are we going to work on this formula in order to get to that number. Okay, thank you. Very informative and very well done presentation. I think everyone up here will concur with that. So I want to thank you again.
Um, there, if you'd please stay seated so you don't have to be checking the boxes or something out there, um, or magicians. Um, we have a few more items from your area that we will ask you to go over with us if you don't mind. So uh, at this time, do I have a motion to approve item 17.02 as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And is there any discussion? Okay. If we can have a roll call vote, please, President Garcia. Student Trustee Circle. Yes. Trustee Odin. Yes. Trustee Kinneman. Yes. Trustee Bennis. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Aye. Trustee Stefan. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, that brings us to 17.03, resolution number 061523-1, temporary loan. Uh, before we take action, <laughs> excuse me, I'd like to ask Vice President Garcia to provide an overview of this item. Thank you, Vice President Garcia. Please proceed. Sure. So this is an item that we take to the um to the board every year. It's a resolution that we need to submit to the county. And this is basically only for worst case scenarios. It allows the county, if there's any cash flow issues between funds or between fund balances, the county does not allow any specific fund to go negative fund balance. So at that time, because of cash flows or timing issues, they do automatic backfills up to a certain point. So this resolution basically gives the authority to the county to be able to cover those funds while the other funds are coming in. Um, so it's very rarely used. Um, in my previous institution, the only time I've ever seen it used for it was for the child development fund. Usually that fund usually used to have cash flow issues, um, but it used to always get settled at the end of the year. So it's really a resolution to give the county um, the authority to be able to move funds be or funds, I know it's a lot of funds there, funds between other funds. Thank you. Um, let's see where I'm at. It's okay. Do I have a motion to approve item 17.03 as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? A roll call vote. President Garcia. Student Trustee Circle. Yes. Trustee Odin. Aye. Trustee Kinneman. Yes. Trustee Perez? Aye. Trustee Gonzalez? Aye. Trustee Stefan? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And 17.04, resolution number 061523-2, adoption of wire transfer payments. Do I have a motion to approve item 17.04 as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Um, Vice President Garcia, um, I was kind of shocked about this. So could you just explain this to us very briefly? So, Diana will go oh, ahead. Diana. This is just pretty much um, to, to have the, uh, the appropriate parties to be allowed to sign off on, on wires within the district. So of course it would be fiscal services, um, certain people appointed, of course, uh, uh, fiscal services, uh, the president, um, and it's um, just so the county has is aware of who is the allowable party. Okay, and we didn't have this before. Is that correct? Uh, I believe it was. I believe it was in, in last year's um, um, uh, June board meeting. But previously to that, I believe so. It's fairly new. Yeah, okay. and that might be because the county in the past did not accept wire transfers. Okay, so so I hope that clarified it for anybody that had any questions on that. Um, seeing no discussion, could we have a roll call vote, please, President Garcia? Student Trustee Sarko? Yes. Trustee Odin? Aye. Trustee Kinneman? Yes. Trustee Bettis? Aye. Trustee Gonzalez? Aye. Trustee Stefan? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. 
and 17.05 resolution number 061523-3, appropriations subject to proposition four, GAN limitation. Before we take action, if I could ask VP Garcia to please provide an overview of this item as well. Thank you. Sure. So this item is brought to the board every year. Um, basically, Proposition 4, as you read there, uh, was something that was adopted in 1979, which basically was to cap uh, government and school spending uh, up to the, uh, for that year, 78, 79, with increases to inflation and um, uh, really headcount or population in the area. So throughout the years, we have to do this calculation that is provided to us. Um, and basically, we take the actual higher of two amounts, our increase in enrollment, which kind of dictates our population, or our increase in taxes. So as you can see in our GAN limit here, the increase in taxes is a little bigger than our enrollment uses those factors. So that is the num number that we're taking, that we're adopting. Um, it, just for your information, our current uh, apportionment through the state is actually lower than that $90 million. If in case you had any questions, it's about $88 million. So we're still below that cap. So basically this is something an exercise that we have to do every year just to, and there is provisions whether uh, or not, it, it's usually the higher of the two. So for instance, if your enrollment goes down, but your property taxes to continue to go up, they still allow you to, um, to take the higher of the two amounts or vice versa. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to approve item 17.05 as presented? So I'll move. Uh, I heard Trustee Gonzalez, which is right here. It was second, please. Second. And thank you, Trustee Kinneman. Is there any discussion on this? Oh, okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote? President Garcia? Student Trustee Sarko? Yes. Trustee Odin? Aye. Trustee Kinneman? Aye. Trustee Perez? Aye. Trustee Gonzalez? Aye. Trustee Stefan? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. And now we're to 17.06, resolution number 061523-4, adoption of education protection account funding and expenditures. Once again, Vice President Garcia, could we please have an overview of this item before we take action? Sure, so this was dedicated based on Prop 30, and I think it was 19, no, not 19, 2012. Um, when the state was having some difficulties, it, pro it passed Prop 30, which increased our sales tax and our income tax. One of those provisions, um, has now uh, sunsetted and the old, I think there's only one left that goes through 2030. So basically that wasn't for new funding. It was basically to bridge the gap of that deficit that the state was having. Um, so, but in order to do that, districts had to, that number was identified by the state. The state lets you know, okay, this is your EPA revenue for this year. It's, uh, it's stated in our apportionment reports. Um, and then what the districts have to do is what we do is we identify all our, because it could only be spent on uh, faculty. So what we do is we take all our faculty expenditures, um, not salaries and benefits and apply it to this funding that we have. Um, so basically when we do that entry, we have to not only adopt it by the board, present it and actually have it up in our website. So that's what this, um, this item does is just recognize that we are recognizing this um, revenue stream and how we're being how we're spending it, and it's being spent on completely all salary and benefits of faculty members. Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. Do I have a motion to approve item seventeen point zero six as presented? I'll move. Thank you, Trustee Perez. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. President Garcia. Student Trustee Sarko? Yes. Trustee Odin? Yes. Trustee Kinneman? Aye. Trustee Perez? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Aye. Trustee Stefan? Aye. 
motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, 17.07. Um, FY 2025 to 2029, this is a five-year capital outlay plan. And one last time, Vice President Garcia, if we could have an overview of this item before we take action. Sure, and I'm going to invite John White to discuss this item. Good afternoon. The approval of the five-year construction plan is an action item for the uh, for the board that requests uh, is mandatory. It's an annual update of the district's uh, space utilization information and its priority capital projects, uh, and it is uh, updated annually. The information is reviewed by the trustees prior to submission of the plan, which will be signed uh, with your endorsement by the superintendent president, and this is per ed code. In addition to being a useful tool for the district, the five-year construction plan communicates to the state legislature through the Department of Finance and the chancellor's office, particularly for state-funded eligible projects, what our intentions are. And it takes into account our um, capacity or workload um, productivity, in five categories of space that are called out lecture laboratory office library and audio visual tv media the five-year construction plan measures the utilization of our facilities using previously established formulas adopted by the chancellor's office in the state a similar process is used by cal state and the uc system the the tool also compares demand for instruction and office space utilization Enrollment pro projections are used to forecast need, which are uh, calculated by the chancellor's office. And the state will only contribute capital dollars if uh, the need uh, space need is demonstrated per formula. Uh, traditionally, there has been a surplus of classroom and office space at College of the Desert and a small need for, cl for uh, class lab space uh, um, that is True this year as well. We're over capacity for our classroom space, about 125% of what would show would be our allowance or need. Uh, but we're much closer when it comes to class labs and office of being on target. The annual five year capital construction plan is due to the Chancellor's Office on July 3rd, and it requires the board approval. The total value of the latest capital program over its life of multiple year, five years, um, this uh, last a year ago was $438.3 million. Uh, it's funded through a combination of district resources and a small contribution for state eligible projects. Uh, to let you know, about 99% of our capital program is funded using the bonds. So 1% or uh, just under 2% from the state, and the, that's our current profile. This year, the district resources uh, that show uh, the value is $676 million. That's rounded. And... Um, I'm going to just very briefly mention to you about the priority list, which is in your, is in the uh, five-year capital plan, the pri priority list of projects. So as is traditional, the projects are listed chronologically with continuing projects or projects in design as the highest priority. Therefore, Palm Springs development project is followed by the athletics uh, stadium and fields, which is followed by the science building renovation project and so on. All six of the continuing projects are by definition the highest priority projects for the district. A seventh project is uh, proposed in this plan, which is an Indio surface parking lot project, which did appear in last year's plan, but at a larger scope and budget. The project is now a surface parking lot only without a parking structure. This reduces the number of spaces from 361 spaces to 234 spaces and reduces the total project budget from 27.8 million to 5.1 million, 5 million. 
with completion still planned for 2027, 28, subject of funding. Obviously, this additional parking is in conjunction with the new facilities being constructed and coming online in Indio. It's also in cooperation with the city of India, where we've had a longstanding memorandum of understanding to provide parking for our, our own students, staff, and faculty. Projects 8 through 11 represent desired projects for the future that will require more extensive feasibility and cost studies and funding would need to be identified. One of the future projects, the Liberal Arts Building renovation may qualify for partial state funding based mainly on its age and the building and configuration of space, which is no longer ideally configured for teaching. Since last year, there has been a shift toward online learning away from classroom learning. And this affects space standards and, and space allocations calculated for, for the district. So for example, a decrease in enrollment using in-person facilities lessens the need for uh, construction or space on a physical campus. A comparison of, uh, I already mentioned about the, uh, we're still showing about 125% excess of uh, the standard for classrooms. Given the age of facilities, particularly those on the Palm Desert campus, it should be expected that there will be a need to plan and pay for ongoing maintenance and operations, deferred maintenance and capital renewal. Many of these expenses are eligible for bond funding, but only if bonds are available. The state is providing less support for operations and maintenance of plant funds compared to the past two years, although historically this, this category of funding for districts has been underfunded. And that concludes my formal remarks. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. And one of the things I wanna reiterate of what uh, Mr. White said is, it's very important to have these projects on this list because if we ever want to submit an IPP, an initial project proposal or FPP to the state for funding, um, if it's not on this list, they won't even consider it. So it's important to, uh, on a yearly basis, just review this list, see where we're at. Um, if we don't think we're gonna submit something in the next five years, there's no point in putting it in there um, because we're just really taking up a space. But it, it is really important to have information in there, specifically if you're gonna ask for funds from the state. And as he mentioned before, deferred maintenance has always been an issue uh, on the community colleges. The last two, three years, we've been getting a lot, a lot of money, but I could tell you the previous five, six years, we were getting nothing. So that means it's up to the colleges to figure out how to pay for their own deferred maintenance. And as you know, I come from a campus that was built in 1913. Um, and you know, this campus is uh, old as well. You know, things come up, one emergency could be a million dollars. Um, do we have any questions at this time from any of the board members? Trustee Perez? Yeah, one question. Um, John, you mentioned that uh, there was, we downscaled the <clears throat> parking structure that uh, we were thinking about building in Indio. Um, what was the space differential again? The, re the reduced scope uh, changes and reduces the number of spa parking spaces constructed from 361 spaces to 234 spaces. Our demand for spaces is greater than either of these numbers, but it is an attempt to work um, uh, as best we can as with our impact with our facilities. As we are we're growing our facilities, we need to provide more parking, and that's our MOU with the city of Indio. So this will at least try, um, try will uh, improve the situation, and you know I'll also say that it, you know we, we will see what the demand is because there is a change in terms of a shift away from in-person um, attendance for class for classrooms and instruction versus not. This particular site could definitely be developed further in the future and a parking structure could be uh, added or placed on this site, which was one of the options that was studied. It's just at this time, we don't believe that we have, uh, there doesn't appear to be bond funding for that. And it's very expensive on a cost 
per space basis. So, so this is uh, the most affordable option to go forward and keeps us on track with the timing that we had always discussed with the city. Madam Chair. So that's just surface parking, correct? Correct. That's correct. But will is the plan for the design of that surface parking to be prepared for expansion, perhaps even for structured parking in the next phase? Yes, we have an option that the dark the architect has prepared that could convert it particularly to a hybrid solution mm -hmm. where we would maintain part of it as surfing, uh, excuse me, as surface parking, but also build, construct on it a new parking structure. So that would increase the capacity beyond what this is on the current site. It's just that it would be subject to, it would have an increased budget and you would want to fund the funding for it. Okay, thank you. So this was our, our best, uh, shot at being able to increase parking. So the land that we're talking about is actually city owned land. So it's not our land. So this we thought was the best thing we could do and the quickest thing we could do, because as John mentioned, um, it doesn't seem like a lot, but a parking structure right now is probably trending to a cost of between 30 and $38,000 a space. So you could just imagine, you know, if you're doing a parking structure, it could easily cost you 30 to $40 million. I know it sounds ridiculous, but. Uh, Chairman Steps. Yeah, so I guess, again, we're seeing us cutting corners, for lack of better words, if you will, with other capital projects in order to fund a bigger project. Um, because uh, I can tell you right now that the city of India was not very happy with this downscale um, parking lot. They feel that we've made a commitment to them. They've worked with us and we've made a promise to them and we are backing out on our promise here. So um, I just wanted to put that out there for, for us to keep in mind as we're um, having these discussions. Yeah, and, and we've met with the city manager of India. <laughs> Chair, may I make one additional yeah. comment? That, mm -hmm. So I wanted to point out that we are providing additional parking as part of the expansion project itself. So about 150 spaces coming on board with the Indio expansion project. So this is on top of that. Chairman, I, I did want to follow up. Thank you. I want to follow up on Trustee Perez's comments because I've heard similar concerns and had several meetings as well. Are we, and said I'd go back and read the MOU and let's see what we committed to. Are we meeting what we committed to in this, what we're look, looking So at? the memorandum of understanding does not, it does not speak to numbers of spaces. It speaks to the cooperation between the city and the uh, college, as we both have a mutual desire to increase parking in the downtown core. So they're also interested, you know, they're, they're particularly as they grow and develop, the city's concern primarily is if our students or we're parking on, on the streets, that's fewer parking spaces for the commercial district and such down there. But, you know, just as we're slowed in development, I mean, they've been somewhat just you know, it's one thing to have plans. It's another thing to get your facilities built and actually generate the demand. So, I mean, I, I would point out to you that I think that we are following the spirit of the memorandum of understanding. The city has um, would like to continue to work actively with us. They did comment to us that if that project could be accelerated in timing, it would be appreciated. They also communicated to us the desire, if it was possible, to move beyond a memorandum of understanding to something more formal. And that might be uh, addressing part of what you're, you've heard. It is, uh, especially the timing, because they have some pretty aggressive plans. Correct, correct. Uh, the, uh, at one point, there was some discussion about public-private partnership related to a structure. Has there been any additional ex exploration around that? No, there has not. Okay. Will there be? Well, I would say part of that is we have to work very closely with the city because the city owns the property. So it's not just us wanting to endorse 
some type of public-private relationship, but we would have to work very closely with the city to see what could be done given that they own the property. Right, but like a revenue share of some sort or something yeah, like that. Yes, I think that's part of the reason the city wants to continue to, ha to have ongoing con discussions with us and not like once a year con discussions. Yeah, and we continue to have collaborative meetings as far as uh, share use of the space, not only for College of the Desert, but also for the city employees. And obviously when there's not a huge demand by our students for the actual downtown city and all the new development that's happening there to be able to utilize that space as well. Any other uh, questions? If I may, I, I had a similar question that Trustee Kinneman asked about, you know, us exploring partnerships, because I would hate for our students to park somewhere and then get a ticket. You know, and I know the city of Indio is expanding that area as well. So I think it's going to get a little, a little hairy there. Um, just to echo the comment made by uh, Trustee Perez, um, you know, like I already stated, I'm not going to be a dead horse, but... You know, I definitely don't think that uh, Palm Springs project will come in at the price tag that's been set on it. And, you know, it is just going to be really interesting to see what else is going to be impacted. So, not a question for you, sir, just a, just a comment. Um, but I think uh, it is worth exploring shared costs possibly with the cities, you know, whether it be Cathedral City, Palm Springs, India, Coachella, whatever, wherever we have one, I think that. I would, again, I would hate for our students to end up with ticket parking tickets. If there's no other discussion, could we have a roll call vote, President Garcia? Sure. Uh, student Trustee Sarko? Yes. Trustee Odin? Aye. Trustee Madam Kinsley? Chair? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, you don't have a motion on the table. Oh, I thought I. Well, how'd we get a discussion? Because you uh, asked for the presentation prior to the. Oh, and then I just went, oh, I asked for questions. Yes. Oh, I apologize. Okay. I apologize. Okay. I got ahead of myself, huh? Okay. So before we vote, and I apologize to everybody, uh, do I have a motion to approve item 17.07 as presented? So moved. Was there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, now, any further discussion? Yes. Yes. I, I just want to be assured on the parking, it is being developed where it can be expanded. Where it can be expanded. It like, oops. yes. Okay. That's all I need. Anything else? Anyone? Seeing none. Now we can have a roll call vote. And I apologize, President Garcia. No worries. Uh, student Trustee Sarko? Yes. Trustee Odin? Aye. Trustee Kinneman? Aye. Trustee Perez? Aye. Trustee Gonzalez? She's out of her seat for a moment. Trustee Stefan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And I want to thank um, Vice President uh, Garcia, and I want to thank uh, Mr. John White. Thank you very much. Very informative and very um, well done presentation. Thank you very much, thank both you. of you. And thank you uh, for the roll call the second time there, President Garcia. Apologize again. Um, now we move down to 18.01. We're in information items from the Board of Trustees, 18.01. Uh, June 2023 Capital Projects Report per Resolution 012122-3. This item is brought to the Board today as information, and it is in your binder. At this time, I'd like to invite Robert Rosher, Program Manager from Moss, to present an overview of the report, Robert. We, oh, God, you guys are fast. I don't even get to read the thing. You're right there. Johnny on the spot. We're trying to help okay. you. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, thank you again for having me here, Chair Stefan, trustees, uh, Dr. Garcia, wherever you are. Um, 
if we're ready, we'll go ahead and get right into it. You will see uh, some positive movement in this report this month, and you will also see that a few of the items I discuss will um, effectively be progress from when this report was uh, finalized in its draft. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of information that isn't actually on the page. If we could, let's see, is this gonna, okay. We'll do it this way. Um, let's go to the next page, please. Very good. So uh, we currently have um, three significant projects at the Palm Desert campus including one at the McCallum Theater, which I'll discuss. We know about the Palm Springs Development Project and Roadrunner Motors in Cathedral City. And then finally, the two Indio projects, the Campus Expansion and the Child Development Center flanking the existing building. So let's go to the next page. We'll start with the Athletic Stadium and Fields Project. Um, we are pleased to report that the project is currently on track and is with the Division of the State Architect. We have received preliminary comments from DSA, and we are working through getting those satisfied and getting the plans resubmitted this month. So that project is very well on track. Is there a way we can have this blown up? We, we don't have hard copies. It should be in the back. Isn't it in the back of your binder? Chair Stephan, we only provide printed copies for trustees that request it. Oh, um, I apologize. And yes, we'll, uh, we'll request that we blow that up for everybody. If okay, this is my request. I'm so sorry. I just assumed since I... Sorry about that, Robert. No, thank you. And then, yeah, if we can have just a full screen of the presentation, that would be... I think that'll suffice. Is that better? Yes. yes. Now we can do that. All right. You don't have that eye candy thing to put in front of us. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very good. So the McCallum Theater Asphalt Project, this is listed uh, with activities starting in Q2. I'm sure many of you saw the fences around the parking lot. That work is actually underway right now, and it's going very well. This is a collaborative effort with the McCallum Theater, and I just wanted to say thank you to Robert McConaughey and his team. They've been uh, great partners to work with so far. We can go to the next one. The Palm Springs Development Project, as uh, noted this morning in uh, Dr. Kinneman's comments, the schematic design phase for the project as uh, delineated by the February action of this board was completed as of yesterday. We gave the final public Brown Act uh, meeting report and um, had great cooperation from our uh, city representatives. That project is now um, moving directly into the design development phase. And we anticipate that the schedule shown in this report will hold solid and we will be ready to occupy the campus right at the beginning of 2027 in time for the spring term. The next project on the list is Roadrunner Motors in Cathedral City. Um, I'm pleased to report that the design development phase for this project is actually complete, and we have made our presentation to Executive Cabinet and received uh, approval to move forward into the construction documents phase. That is the, the normal process at the end of the design development phase. We do not present to the Board of Trustees. Typically, we simply have a meeting with Executive Cabinet, and they continue to move us forward. So that has happened and we are on target schedule-wise. The next project is the Science Building Renovation Project. This is the one that Mr. White mentioned that accounts for state funding. It is also on track, currently being reviewed by uh, DSA once again. And once again, we do have preliminary comments from them that the design team is working on addressing and responding to. So we are, um, very optimistic that we'll complete the DSA process and move directly into bidding and construction. Next project, please. The Indio campus expansion is now getting back on track after the uh, issues that we've talked about previously with the steel contractor. Uh, we're very pleased to say that the heavy steel construction is nearly complete 
and they are also doing uh, extensive uh, concrete work on site. It's quite a thing to see if you get a chance to take a look at it. Um, and it's moving along now at uh, hopefully a slightly accelerated pace as we try to make up for a little bit of lost time. The next project then, of course, is kind of the part two of the Indio campus expansion. And we'll continue to report it, but won't have much to say about it. It's already approved by DSA and ready to go once we complete the new building. All right. The final project then is the Indio Child Development Center. There's a lot of activity going on at this project right now. We are getting uh, the final pieces in place to have the building fully enclosed and begin the interior finishes, which are uh, really the last phase of the project. If you, if you take a look at it now, you'll see there's a lot of activity, a lot of work going on both inside and outside. And uh, we're very pleased with the progress of this project as well. So that concludes our report for this month. However, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer. Thank you. Um, any trustees have any questions? Yes. Um, you know what mine are, baby. I, I've got a really big one. So the Inio Child Development Center, it says construction ends the third quarter of 2023. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move in. So reading between the lines on the question there, yeah. we are seeing significant delays in the global market for electronic components. And in this case, the direct impact is to our air conditioning units. We have uh, put measures in place to provide temporary air conditioners um, by means of the contractor who's responsible for the permanent ones. I will say that our confidence level regarding that contractor's delivery of the final units is lower than it should be. We anticipate that there will continue to be a challenge there. So what we're doing is working with the engineers and the, um, the contractors to see if there's a way to get the building complete using the temporary equipment. And then even after the building is occupied, swap out those temporary air conditioners for the final ones. That plan is in play now. And I am pleased to report that the contractor, uh, Couts, uh, which is an outfit that has done a great deal of work with us in the past, is being very cooperative. So there is a concern, but we are addressing it. Does that answer the question? Is it look like before the end of 2023, we will be able to move in then or not? That is our hope. Now, I have to be completely honest. The delay that we've seen so far is absolutely unprecedented. Those units were ordered in May of last year, and they were supposed to be delivered in January. And the delay uh, or the delivery date has been delayed numerous times. The, the thing that is perhaps noteworthy here is that we have checked with every conceivable source to verify the global impact of what we're seeing. And it's a unanimous return across the board. Everyone understands this is where we are. This is part of the post COVID fallout. So. Okay. So bring it, let's see. Oh, this is just a report. So there are no other questions from any of the board members. Thank you very much, Robert. That was very informative. And um, I didn't like the last answer, but that doesn't matter. Nobody's trying no to one please does. me post-COVID, no. are they? <laughs> no. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you. And we'll keep our fingers crossed. Okay. So moving on. Um, this is information regarding human resources. Uh, CSEA MOU, permanent work year increase, disabled students programs and services, DSP and S assistant. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, moving on. 
19.02 CSCA MOU, permanent work year increase public safety officers. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? And 19.03 CSEA MOU, healthcare plan addition. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? And I don't see none, we'll move on. And this is 20.01 information for administrative services. Um, administrative procedure 3721 virtual private network VPN. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, we're now to information for instruction 21.01 administrative procedure 4031 textbook adoption. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? And 21.02 administrative procedure 4111. Posthumous degrees. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? See none. 21.03 academic senate resolutions. This item is brought to the board today as information. Are there any questions from the board? See none. And that brings us to our study session, 22.01, the Basic Needs Center. At this time, I'd like to invite Jocelyn Vargas, Basic Needs Center Manager, to present this item. Jocelyn, please proceed. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jocelyn Vargas. Uh, I want to first of all thank you, uh, board members, um, Executive Kamnak, Dr. Garcia. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share a little bit about our basic needs centers, uh, the progress that we've made. Um, as a new initiative, I do want to acknowledge that um, you know there's always opportunity for growth improvement. Um, so we're all constantly um, adapting to make sure that we're serving student needs. So um, yes, want to start by sharing a little bit of what we've been doing. Um, so really, Assembly Bill 132 has provided the framework for uh, the launch of our basic needs centers. Uh, AB 132 defines basic needs as anything pertaining to housing, uh, food, clothing, hygiene items, uh, technology, and the list goes on. Um, AB 132 mandated that educational institutions uh, increase access to uh, both on-campus and off-campus off resources for students. Um, prior to AB 132, COD was providing resources in various departments, uh, programs. Um, what this uh, legislation really allowed us to do is hire a coordinated staff member to assist with the cross-campus coordination of these services. Uh, the basic needs centers really serve as a one-stop shop um, uh, location for our students to get that one-on-one -on -one access to be able to get connected to various services. Currently, we have two staff members, so myself uh, serving as a manager for basic needs, as well as our outreach specialists who provide support for our college core program on campus. So initially, we did not have a lot of data that really provided a picture of our what the needs are on campus. I think we, we've all, as you know, serving students, we kind of have a good understanding of what students need. Uh, we really uh, utilized the Hope Center uh, 2021 Basic Needs Survey to really help us um, inform some of the services that we should be providing. Uh, I do wanna just highlight a couple of things from the 2021 survey. Uh, it indicated that participants uh, who were at two-year institutions, uh, three out of five of them were um, stating that they were experiencing food, uh, basic need insecurity. Uh, Thirty-nine percent stated uh, being affected by food insecurity. Um, Forty-eight percent affected by housing insecurity, and uh, fourteen percent stating that they were affected by homelessness. Um, you know, from the visits that we have at the pantry, uh, these this data really did resonate with a lot of the students that were coming into our pantry. 
Uh, since the launch of the, the centers, uh, we've had the opportunity in the spring of 2023 to uh, participate in the uh, California Real College California uh, survey. Um, we're still, we just got the information, but um, some of the information that we received um, let me backtrack. Um, we, you know, we emailed the students on campus uh, currently enrolled in that spring term. Uh, we had about 1,100 students uh, who opened the email. 80% uh, of those students uh, completed the actual survey. So uh, some of the things that we, you know, it's been really insightful to start kind of looking at that data. Uh, some of the striking things that came up that I've already kind of seen, um, students who participated in the survey stated that in the last 12 months, 12 months, um, about 67% of those uh, survey participants stated unable the inability to pay or underpaid uh, rent or mortgage. Um, about 68% of those uh, participants stated not being able to pay a utility bill. 76% uh, stated having to move in or um, expect or living in a, in a household uh, over capacity. Uh, so maybe there's two or three families living in a household. Um, and I think the other data that was kind of striking for me is 17.2% uh, of those respondents that stated that they experienced uh, homelessness in the last uh, 12 months. So uh, we'll be using this information. Like I said, we just got the data. And so we'll be working with our institutional research, research department and other departments to really try to understand a little bit better what the needs are for our students. In the fall of 22, uh, we did launch the basic needs intake form. So this is accessible uh, through one click from our main web page. Uh, students are able to, um, this is a, a way for students to re reach out to our, our center. Uh, they can indicate what type of resource they're looking for. They may uh, be in need of uh, LGBTQ resources. And so we really try to uh, connect students to both on-campus and off-campus resources using this uh, intake form. Uh, this, these numbers are from the uh, fall term, but since then we have, we've had about 150 requests. Um, I think it's not a surprise that the areas of need continue to be in areas of transportation, on and off campus food uh, resources and housing. Uh, partnerships have really be a, been a key in our ability to serve students and connect students. So um, one of the partnerships that we have is through Fine Food Bank. Uh, through that partnership, we're able to host a community health worker or a promotor. Um, so they have dedicated office hours within um, our pantry location here in Palm Desert. They assist students with completing uh, either housing um, section eight vouchers, CalFresh, uh, utility assistance, uh, a wide range of services. So uh, they are available here at our Palm Desert location. With respect to housing, um, it's definitely a significant challenge for our students. Uh, we see, you know, from the data that we received in the survey, um, as well as the visits that we get, um, housing is really a, a big need. Um, I did want to mention, according to uh, data in 2019 um, by USC and a local nonprofit, um, Coachella Valley families, over 50% of CB families are experiencing rent burden, which means that uh, more than a third of their uh, income is going to, to rent. Um, so it's not a surprise that we're seeing that here on campus as well. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to address and support students with housing insecurity is through uh, working with the continuum of care. So Riverside County continuum of care. Uh, we've been referring students to this Home Connect resource where they're provided with caseworker assistance uh, to identify immediate emergency shelter. Um, one of the er other areas that we're looking to explore is uh, partnerships with nonprofits that are really kind of the experts in this area to really provide more uh, caseworker assistance. Um, so we're really starting to look at um, what are some of the opportunities to be able to either provide more rental assistance or utility assistance um, and ultimately find long term uh, housing. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing is that um, rental assistance programs that were readily available through the pandemic are, are no longer available, either because the funding has been spent or um, there's, there's just not, those resources are just not continuing uh, now that we come back from the pandemic. So, so partnerships will be key in the coming months. 
For students who are disclosing that they are unhoused, we do uh, offer them uh, the ability to access our on-campus gym facilities. Uh, they do have to fill out a form every term and they do have to be a currently enrolled student. So we work with our public safety uh, as well as athletics to be able to provide this opportunity for those students. Um, they're able to have uh, access to hygiene products through our pantry. Um, and then they do have uh, the ability to access our showers on campus. With respect to transportation, um, through our partnership as an institution with Sunline, students are still able to use their COD ID uh, to be able to have uh, free access to public transportation. Uh, we've also been providing emergency gas cards for students who are experiencing a hardship. Um, so that is available through our pantries. So food insecurity is uh, definitely an area that we've been working a lot around, um, and I feel like we've made a significant progress to expand our services. Uh, we used to offer um, and hold uh, monthly food distributions. Uh, we also had our food pantries. Uh, we continue to provide uh, food distribution events at our offsite locations. Um, so we uh, are scheduling those uh, throughout the term. Uh, we've also expanded the snack pantries across uh, both our main campus and our off campus locations. So students are able to uh, get up to two uh, snacks per day um, at one of the pantry locations across you know, the campus. Um, so this, I'm really excited to share about this, uh, but our, through our partnership with Fine Food Bank, we've been able to open uh, successfully two on-campus uh, pantry locations. Uh, we, at both Palm Desert and Indio, our hours of operation are Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 4.30. Uh, students only need to have their student ID uh, and be a currently registered student to access our services. Uh, students can get up to a maximum of 15 pounds and uh, can visit once a week uh, either one of our pantry locations. I did want to share a little bit um, of data that we, you know, were able to connect collect from our pantry visits uh, in the fall term. Um, we had about um, 1,100 households that we served um, in both our India and Palm Desert location for a total of 4,400 visits, uh, which was really surprising. Um, in terms of pounds, I was shocked when I saw this number, but we received about 114 uh, pounds of food um, and non-perishable items at our, at our pantries. For our spring term, um, we had uh, 1,200 uh, households that were served. Uh, 6,200 visits, and we did have a total of 84,000 uh, pounds that we received at both of our locations. Here's a picture of our Palm Desert Campus uh, pantry. We opened in September. It's located at, at South Annex 6. Uh, we have uh, food items, non-perishable items. We also have uh, clothing that's been donated that's also available for our students. Our second location, we opened in November. We uh, had the opportunity to host a, a, a ribbon cutting ceremony and um, as well as uh, launch our college core program. Uh, we had Cal Volunteer Chief of Service Officer Josh Friday and other partners join us that day. Um, you know, a lot of visitors that come to our pantry, they, they love the Indio campus. Uh, I, I think they share um, that it looks just like a grocery store, right? Maybe even a Sprouts. Uh, but I think one of the, the goals with this is really um, our ability to destigmatize uh, food insecurity and access on our campus. So I think um, trying to create that envi environment is really important for, for us at both of our sites. Couple more pictures uh, from the Indio campus. Uh, our morning hours are really popular with students at Indio. Uh, they love the free coffee and the snacks. Um, so we were very uh, busy in the in the mornings at Indio. I also want to mention um, we in the spring term we launched our uh, Roadrunner meal box. Um, so in an effort to address uh, you know a challenge with transportation, many students can get to one of our main sites. Uh, we prepackage boxes and take them um, to one of our offsite locations, so students are able to access food um, off campus um, or off you know. At, either Coachella or um, Desert Hot Springs, Palm Springs. Um, so we'll be working with our educational center directors to improve um, and increase more uh, participation in this program. So um, 
you know, the success of our pantries and our efforts to address food insecurity, I feel is really, um, you know, significantly due to our ability to leverage the College Corps grant. So I wanted to share a little bit of what we're doing with College Corps. Uh, it is an initiative through the Office of the Governor. We're one of 19 community colleges that was awarded this grant. Uh, there's three goals to it. Uh, one, creating civic-minded leaders uh, the, with the ability to bridge divides, help low-income students uh, complete their degrees in a timely manner and with less debt. Um, and third, uh, address societal challenges to help build more equitable communities in the Coachella Valley. Uh, one of the key things about our program that makes it really unique is that we're solely focused on food insecurity and we have only one uh, community host partner, which is a uh, fine food bank. Uh, other institutions have multiple partners, um, are working on different areas, uh, but we decided to solely focus on food insecurity. Uh, we are currently onboarding uh, for our cohort two. Uh, we closed our application June 5th. Uh, we're looking to fill 56 fellowship opportunities. 16 of those are for AB 540 students. Um, what's uh, unique, I think um, it's the first time that they've allowed undocumented students to participate in this program. So we're really excited to be able to, to have this opportunity for students. Uh, really, the goal is that they complete 450 hours of service, uh, and in return, they get $10,000 for their um, successful completion of the program. So the students get to volunteer at one of our on-campus pantries or one of the fine food uh, distribution locations. Um, so this program really has created a lot of opportunities for our students from, you know, participating in the governor's uh, swearing in ceremony. Um, in this uh, slide, I just wanted to share our College Corps ambassador, uh, Duan Nunley, uh, took part in a statewide panel. Um, you know, the title was Real Food Fight, uh, Free Food Fridges and, and, and Other Innovations. He got the opportunity to talk about, you know, his experience working in that in, in College Corps alongside of uh, Fine Food CEO, as well as uh, Chief of Staff uh, for Nancy Skinner. Um, so it's really creating opportunities for students to build their leadership skills and really highlight some of the work they're doing here in the Coachella Valley. Uh, the other picture uh, we got to present at ACCA, uh, it's a long uh, title, Association of California Community Colleges, uh, College Administrators uh, Annual Conference. And uh, two of those fellows got to participate in presenting their story uh, alongside of um, staff as well. Um, College Corps is, is a regional investment. Um, I think we're really starting to see the, the great, um, you know, growth in our students and the impact in our community. And, um, you know, students, I think it's really helped them understand how food insecurity impacts community college students um, and really how it's been impacting our, our families in the Coachella Valley. So a couple of pictures there. Donations, we are accepting donations. So for any non-perishable items, um, they can contact one of our staff members. Uh, monetary donations, we are working with our COD Foundation um, for those uh, who are interested. Have my contact information. I just want to end by thanking, um, you know, I, I think I want to make sure that I acknowledge that this work is not, you know, solely of two people. Um, it really is uh, the collaboration across departments, staff from our maintenance staff to our leadership. Um, so I do want to thank um, everyone who collaborates with us to be able to serve and meet student needs. And yeah, I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Are there any questions from the board? Yes. Yes. First of all, I'd like to commend you on what you're doing. Uh, let's face it, there are so many students who are facing so many issues that they can't really accomplish because they're hungry or they don't have a place to, to stay. Um, I'm absolutely blown away with the two components of the unhoused, that equals 62%, the 48 and, it's, and the 12. It's just, I'm thinking that perhaps we should look at working with the Coachella Valley Housing Coalition because very often they can secure grants that are specific 
And if we work specifically with each municipality, they may have land that they're willing to donate. And if they have land that they're willing to donate, then we can easily work with them and to build some type of housing specifically for students in various cities across the valley and begin to address that particular issue. Um, on the issue with, with the partner with the Fine Food Bank, look, we used to have so many different groups doing it and they finally collaborated. So you're probably working with 10 to 15 groups that used to be separate now working with the Fine Food Bank. So that collaboration is much bigger than it may appear. I also am a certified promotore. I uh, went through the academy uh, maybe five years ago when we were doing work in Coachella and in the city of Palm Springs. Um, I think we could have more of them working with you as connectors from the college to various communities. That would be outstanding. And Maybe I can be of some assistance with that. I hope so anyway, you better go. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Odin. Anybody else wanna have any questions? Trustee Perez? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I as well wanna commend uh, yourself, Jocelyn and, and Lizbeth for the great work that you're doing. When I think of community colleges and what the epitome of what it is that they could be doing for their community, I think it's exactly the good work that you're you're doing for our, our constituency. Um, my question, I guess it's more so um, when you're gathering the data, um, are, do you, are you serving for a zip code as well when you're taking intaking to see where the biggest need is and where we may be able to focus on certain things and um, certain programs or what it is that certain students need in certain areas? Uh, yes, uh, through the intake form, we we did make one of those changes was adding a zip code. So when we are looking for resources, we want to make sure that, you know, if a student is having transportation issues and they're in Cathedral City, that we're connecting them to the Salvation Arm Army as opposed to, you know, Coachella Valley Rescue Mission. And so we do take that into consideration. I think as we're uh, starting to um, improve our processes, we'll be able to do that maybe more um, improve use our, our current systems like our colleague and, and to be able to pull reports that maybe are more reliable than our intake forms. Any other trustees, Trustee Gonzalez? Uh, thank you, Ms. Vargas, for the presentation. I really appreciate the work that everyone is doing uh, centered around those areas because as we all know the majority of our students, you know, don't have the luxury to just go to school. Mm -hmm. right? They could be working and even at that, as we all know, with you know, the way salaries work, it's just not enough. Um, and, you know, I know we all know that our housing markets are just, mm -hmm. you know, out, out of reach, uh, yeah. you know, now for for a lot of uh, people that have been um, disenfranchised from ever achieving the dream, right, of owning a home. Um, it would be nice if sometime in the future, because obviously our money's all gone now, but that would be, that would have been a great, uh, you know, project to add somewhere you know, it would be student housing, because uh, I know that, that that's, that's a difficult feat, right? I know with the housing coalition, one thing that I learned um, when I started uh, really diving deep into housing is that you have to have like impeccable credit in order mm. to qualify for, you know, the sweat equity homes. Um, and, you know, as you know, a lot of our, our students and their circumstances sometimes uh, you know, they may not even have a credit score. So mm -hmm. there's a lot that goes into um, all of that. And I've had to become very familiar with it, uh, you know, because of a lot of the work that we do. So I just, you know, want to say you know, thank you. And, you know, I, I hope we can continue supporting you and your team mm -hmm. as need be. And um, I haven't been to to see these spaces yet, but I definitely am going to uh, put it on my list of things uh, to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just let us know how we can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Kinman. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. And it speaks to the strength of COD. And uh, 
we all know the barriers, eliminating the barriers are the most important things and support systems. Uh, and then the students can be successful. Uh, without that, they, they can't be. Also, there's an organization called HARC that you may be familiar yes. with. And they end up doing a health assessment a community study. I believe they produced it annually and it breaks it down by uh, areas of Coachella Valley and a, a lot of different types of uh, data that's in there that, uh, but you already got so many things to do. You don't need <laughs> us to bring up new things for Ollie, but I didn't know whether you had a chance to collaborate with them any. Okay. All right. Well, this is just uh, very uh, impressive. And thank you. Yeah, I did want to mention uh, we haven't partnered with HARC. I am familiar with them. Um, I think one of the things uh, this year we got the opportunity to participate in the homeless homelessness count uh, that they do annually. They've um, they're doing uh, youth um, in time count, so uh, trying to identify homeless youth. And so I think uh, we try to participate. I think it'll help improve more accurately to know how many of our youth use the transition are actually homeless in our county. Yeah, but data is very important, Great. yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Arco? Um, as a student yeah. myself using the pantry and such, I noticed that it's a great access for, you know, all the students on campus. I actually just got into college corps. I'm in the second cohort. So seeing these um, opportunities available for me and other students like me that might need these basic needs is just great to have. I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, I, could you tell me just a little bit about the real college survey? Yes, um, so it is a survey through, and I'm sorry, I don't have a specific name, but it's a survey that's conducted statewide. Um, so as part of the, we're part of the Community College uh, League of, um, Community college, I like the name, yeah, okay. um, but they we participate in the survey statewide. So they, um, you know, had a series of questions looking at gender, uh, you know, race, uh, you know, demographic, basic demographics. But then it, it asked an extensive list of questions, trying to understand, you know, where students. I mean, basically, students are are having to decide: Do I pay, you know, the lights or pay um, food? Do I pay my rent? Um, so really trying to understand what are those specific areas of need. Um, like I mentioned, I, I haven't had the necessarily the time to go deep dive uh, in their research, but uh, we're hoping to do that. But uh, it was an extensive sur uh, survey that um, had many questions. Because I was thinking, Desert Healthcare District also works with HARC. So the questions that you may have specifically that address student concerns or issues can be incorporated because we've worked with them over the years and made lots of changes and, and adaptations to their document of certain the survey document. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Thank um, you once again. Thank you. Anyone else have anything else? I'd like to again thank you very, very much. This is so critical for all of our students in the whole valley. And um it's something that we've been asking over and over again over the years, you know, how what can we do to help the students? What can we do to help? And we've um, brought up many um, things that we'd like to see done. And I, you're doing such wonderful work. I know you're probably overwhelmed. And uh, if there's any way that the board can assist you or any needs that you have, please don't hesitate to come back to the board and let us know. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. And this brings us to um, the public comment 23.01 because we've already had 22.02, uh, .02, the 2023-2024 tentative budget presentation. So public comments 23.01. This is requests to address the Board of Trustees regarding matters not on the agenda. Remote public participation is allowed and will be accepted in person by email to OTP at collegeofthedesert.edu during the meeting and submitted for the record, or by using the raise your hand function by joining the Zoom link. Pursuant to district 
Administrative Procedure 2345, each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes per topic. 15 minutes shall be the maximum time allotment for public speakers on any one subject, regardless of the number of speakers at any one board meeting. At the discretion of the majority of the board, these limits may be extended. All comments must be submitted or brought forward prior to the end of the public comment section. As an additional note, this item is intended for members of the public who wish to speak regarding matters not related to the agenda. Armando, do we have any public comments? We do, Chair Stefan. We have one individual on Zoom wishing to speak, and that is Sarah Rodriguez. And Sarah, you should be able to unmute yourself here. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I would very humbly like to request two additional minutes to my speaking time. Is that all right? Um, is there any objection from the board? That would allow her five minutes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm Sarah Rodriguez. I am an employee of College of the Desert, and I wanted to address some of the public comments that have been made this year during board meetings. Earlier this year, a member of the public asked why we would want to invest in a city like that when referring to Coachella's Chelsea renovation. A city like that. I will not speculate on the biases and prejudices of people in the Valley um, that they hold against my hometown. I will simply say that nearly 13% of our students live in Coachella. They are enough of a reason to invest. Last meeting, a counselor at College of the Desert asserted that the person who they had heard was suggested, not chosen, for the interim president superintendent position would only be chosen based on their ethnicity. This is a very bold statement to make when Latinos continue to be underrepresented in all employment levels in academia, including leadership. What message does it send to our students at an HSI to have a member of our faculty say something like that? We cannot tout a commitment to DEIA without countering those sentiments, which simply are not rooted in reality or the experiences of our students, staff, and faculty of color. Study after study show that Black Indigenous people of color are denied positions because of racial bias, not gifted them. Lastly, today's public comment included some information that seemed cherry-picked. When comparing the number of students served by satellite campuses, the commenter used Coachella's enrollment alone against that of Cathedral Cities or Desert Hot and Desert Hot Springs. This is not fair a comparison as it, it groups enrollment of two cities compared to one. They then said that a trip from DHS to Palm Desert campus would be 44 minutes one way by bus, whereas it only takes students coming from Coachella 16 minutes to get to the Indio campus. I decided to use my childhood home address in Coachella to check this and found that a bus trip from my home to the Indio campus would take about 40 minutes. Furthermore, the choice of DHS to Palm Desert uh, was a disingenuous comparison since Mecca is further out and would take students from Mecca over an hour to get to the Indio campus. The commenter also very conveniently left out that a trip from DHS to the site of the future Palm Spring campus would be 45 minutes by bus. This was all said in defense of the new Palm Springs campus, which is the most expensive satellite campus yet. Trustee Gonzalez was criticized by this commenter for asking questions about the budget. And as a constituent of Trustee Gonzalez, I appreciate her concern. It is prudent to be productively critical of the budget um, for this project when it has siphoned bond funds from other locations and has a budget of over $400 million. Though I recognize Palm Springs was promised a campus years ago, and I think that they should definitely have a big, beautiful campus, the distribution of the bond funds has not been equitable, as Tracy Perez mentioned earlier today. Why are so many members of the public upset that we are investing in Indio, which is home to 20% of our students? And the funding pales in comparison to that of Palm Springs. Why does Mecca have to fight to exist? I will summarize what I'm hearing. Firstly, our college should physically meet our students where they are. We should continue to invest in the expansion or development of study centers and satellite campuses where our students live to reduce transportation burden and save them uh, time in their already busy schedules. 
DHS has 10% of our total student enrollment. These students should have access to a beautiful, well-staffed campus to support their needs and offer the resources and technology they require to be successful. The same is true for Cathedral City, La Quinta, Coachella, Mecca. Public secondly, public transportation in our valley is severely lacking. We should invest in transportation from our satellite campuses to Palm Desert. Palm Desert has the most courses and resources for our students. No satellite campus will be able to compete with that. If we care about lessening transportation, cost and time burdens, please consider buses or shuttles from our areas of service to Palm Desert. As a student at Cal State San Bernardino, I took the Coyote Cruiser from Palm Desert campus to the main campus in San Bernardino. The road owners should have something similar. Finally, in light of the enrollment handcount by zip code presented at the last regular meeting, it is imperative that we continue to invest in the East Valley. Nearly half of our students are from the East Valley. As a proud alumna of College of the Desert, I took classes at the East Valley campus, which, and I'm dating myself, <laughs> was located at the Workforce Development Center and Coachella Valley High School at the time. I am now a full-time classified employee and an adjunct here. I am a product of the investment in the East Valley. I close with this. Please continue to make choices based on data, good data, data that is not curated to support an already established opinion. All of our students deserve access to quality education. College of the Desert needs to focus on them and not the special interest groups in the Valley. Thank you all so much for your time and happy pride. Thank you very much. And um, are there any other comments? That was the only individual. That was the only one. Okay, at this time, we'll um, go into future agenda items. Future agenda items. Student Trustee Zarco, this is a time when you get to add something to the agenda, something you'd like to see in the future, and then we try to schedule it in. Okay, so. As of right now, nothing. Nothing. Okay, but I'm sure you'll think of something by next time. Huh? <laughs> okay, thank you. And Trustee Odin. Yes, I think I'd like to for us to set up either an agency to agency board meeting between us and Sunline and or a subcommittee between the board members and Sunline to discuss transportation issues throughout the Coachella Valley for our students. Okay. Anything else? Hey, uh, Trustee Kinneman. Uh, nothing at this time, thank you. And Trustee Perez. Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you for that, Trustee Odin. I was thinking the same thing. We had the same wavelength. Um, I do want to, I know I've already mentioned this a million times, but here's one million and one. Um, I just, I wanna make sure that from now on, every bond project that we have, that uh, the budget presentation have a specific allocation of funding uh, to the projects. So again, that's fine. I mean, the majority of the board has voted how they voted, but I still want us to be transparent and clear and show where that money is all being moved from, taken from, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and even though, I don't know what the gentleman's name is, but uh, he mentioned that uh, normally they don't present uh, the design or anything to the board. And I know the the resolution was, uh, you know, done that way purposely, but I would like to see a presentation of the schematic design. Is this for Palm Springs? Yes. I still would like to see one presented here to the board. Present, special presentation. For mm -hmm. Yes. Madam Chair, and I would also like a report back to the board based upon Trustee Gonzalez's request on the board, the bonding update. So um, you want to see what, what specifically can you spell out for me? Because I don't, I don't think I understood what you were requesting. Well, it it appears that they were that the request was already made uh -huh. for the update, and President um, Garcia gave gave us the explanation why it was delayed. 
but can we expect a report by the next board meeting? Okay. And that was on uh, where the funding came from? And, and it should be ongoing because- Is that of, funding sources? Yeah. Is yeah. that what it should be ongoing? Okay. Update. Chair. Yes. Can these reports reflect the value of money? Because we know that the value of money goes down over time. And when people make statements about investments in different places, the value of the money was worth a lot more then. And that way we can, can compare apples to apples much better. All I want to know is what tree the apple's being picked from, if you want to use that analogy. Okay, I got it. Is there anything else? That's all for now, but I'll have more. Okay. Um, at this time, we're going to recess to close session. Let's try to get in there in the next 15 minutes. Does anybody have a phone up? You can give me the time. It will be in 15 minutes. Chair Stefan, that would be 3.38. 3.38. Okay, let's try to be in there at 3.38 so we can get started then. Okay. And um, the live feed of this meeting will continue. And so board members and President Garcia, I ask that you please join closed session at 3.38. Thank you.
like you're double banging. It looks like you're doing it. Okay, we are. What time is it? 4.38? Very good. And that's on. Okay. Um, we're going to reconvene to open session. There was no action taken in the closed section. If the, I will now adjourn the June meeting of the Desert Community College District Board of Trustees at 4.39. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we don't. I didn't get a chance to to, to wish Trustee Kitterman a happy birthday. Uh, he was trying to. Try to get, get out before I said it. <laughs>